Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Good afternoon and welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. Today's show is brought to you by the words education, mathematics, and the color green. This afternoon, we're going to replay a segment I did for Paul's breakfast show with Chris Trotter to get a feel of what is going on inside the Green Party. Now, Chris being Chris, this will be a lovely meander through the history of the Green Party. And then I'll have a chat with education specialist Elwyn Paul about the systemic issues in our education system. Naturally, we'll hear from Cam's buddies, and I'm going to ask them about the mathematics, statistics, and our education system. And of course, we'll have the mailbag to get your feedback too. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. We need to have a serious conversation about the state of education in New Zealand. Our education system, once a point of pride, is now showing demonstrable systemic failings that demand urgent action. Recent data from the Curriculum Insights and Progress Study reveals a startling reality. Only 22% of our Year 8 students are meeting the expected curriculum benchmark for mathematics. And even more alarming, just 12% of Maori students are hitting these marks, and a staggering 63% of the overall Year 8 cohort. That's Form 2 in you know old school uh, style, are more than a year behind in their maths education. Prime Minister Christopher Luxon called these results a total system failure, and I couldn't agree more. These numbers are not just statistics. They represent tens of thousands of children who are being let down by the system, children who are not being set up for success. How did we get here? It's clear that for years our education system has been misaligned with a curriculum that hasn't focused on the basics, inadequate teacher training, and misplaced priorities. And this has left many parents frustrated and despondent, witnessing firsthand the slow progress of their children. And if we're not setting our kids up for success, then we are not setting up New Zealand for success. It's as simple as that. But there is hope. The government is taking decisive action to address these issues. The new Make It Count Maths Action Plan, spearheaded by Education Minister Erica Stanford, aims to overhaul the way maths is taught in our schools. From Term 1 next year, a new structured maths curriculum will be rolled out for a year naught to eight students, and it's based on world-leading practices from countries like Singapore and Australia. This curriculum will be knowledge-rich and focused on the basics, ensuring our children build a strong foundation in maths from an early age. The government is also investing $20 million in professional development for teachers in order to ensure they have the confidence and skills to teach this new curriculum effectively. And on top of that, new standards for incoming teachers will ensure that only those with a solid grasp of maths are entering the profession. These measures will, of course, be supported by twice yearly standardised assessments to identify students who are falling behind with targeted interventions to help them catch up. However, not everyone is on board with these changes. The Labour Party and some teacher unions have accused the government of using manipulated data to justify these reforms. They claim the new benchmarks are unfair because they are based on a curriculum that has not yet been fully implemented. But let's be clear, regardless of whether the figure is 22% or 45%, our children are not where they need to be. 
This is not about moving goalposts. It's about acknowledging a problem and taking action to fix it. Labor's accusations are a distraction from the real issue at hand. We need to focus on solutions, not politics. Our children's education is too important to be caught up in partisan bickering. The changes proposed by the government are based on best practices from around the world and are designed to give our children every opportunity to succeed. We have a moral obligation to ensure that every child in New Zealand receives a quality education. The current system is failing too many of our children, and we cannot afford to wait any longer to make the necessary changes. The Make It Count Maths Action Plan is a critical step towards closing the equity gap and setting our children and our country up for future prosperity. Let's support these reforms and work together to build an education system that truly sets our children up for success. The current system is setting up children for failure. When you want to understand the machinations of any left-wing party in New Zealand, then the only person you can talk to in order to give you a cogent and deep understanding of the issues is none other than Chris Trotter. He's on the line now to discuss what's going on inside the Green Party, where they came from and where they're going. Welcome back to The Crunch, Chris Trotter. It's a pleasure to have you back. A pleasure to be here, Cam. So, Chris, uh, I thought I'd give you a call being a doyen of the left. You know, you've started, a, been involved in the startup of a couple of parties. What on earth is going on inside the Greens? Well, first of all, just the one party, uh, the new Labour Party I was involved with, um, but that's the only one. Um, got the T-shirt somewhere, even got a few rosettes. But the Greens, the Greens, the Greens. Well, I think what we're seeing is either the slow death of the Greens or an opportunity for its most popular um, leader ever, uh, Chloe Swarbrick, uh, to reshape the Greens in a fashion which will enable them to continue to grow as a party and to function as an effective partner for presumably Labour or, or any other um, uh, coalition participant. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting history the Greens have got, isn't it? They've started off as the Values Party and then sort of morphed into various different guises, ended up being the Green Party as part of the alliance, and then they came out of the alliance and stood on their own two feet. And they've kind of like pegged at it about, you know, every now and then they'll get polls that puts them in the high teens. But when reality, when voting comes, their numbers drop away somewhat in, in the final campaign. And I don't know whether that's because they don't have a valid argument or, or, or a, a policy point that's relevant, but for the outsiders of the Greens, it looks like they oppose an awful lot and want to ban a whole lot of things and don't actually propose any sensible solutions that could have any sort of political mileage. Well, it's interesting that you should draw attention to um, their rather negative steps vis-a-vis the rest of the world, because a friend of mine passed on to me some information the other day uh, from the UK, which indicated that objections to development of any sort in the UK, even improvements to local communities, featured objections at the local level at least, and sometimes from the national level also, objections from the Greens, the the UK Greens. It seems as though, as you say, uh, the Greens are almost unable to see anything new uh, anything uh, dramatic happening out there in the world <laughs> without them wanting to stand in the way, which makes them, in reality, a, a very conservative party uh, in some respects. Conservative, I suppose, you know, with the small c and related also, of course, to the word conservation, which you would, I suppose, expect. 
Um, and this may just be a feature of the UK where you have what is known there as the Green Welly Brigade, and these are conservative with a capital C um, environmentalists, one of whom um, was, believe it or not, Margaret Thatcher. So it may just be a peculiarity of the British uh, Green movement. But getting back to New Zealand, I think um, you mentioned values as being the the original um, political impulse in New Zealand. I think that's certainly true, and certainly it was one of the first, if not the first, um, post-scarcity political movements in the world. But, you know, if you look at the history of values, you see in many ways a prefigurement of what is now happening in the Greens. Mm. Because what happened in values was there was a client called uh, John Stewart, and he was based in Christchurch, and he was an old-fashioned socialist, but he understood um, the importance of conservation um, in an industrial world. And he was very involved um, with the Greens, and he was a classic old-school um, grassroots organiser. Mm. Uh, and he built values into uh, what, by 1978, uh, that would have been the third election they contested, was a pretty staunch um, left-wing party. Eco-socialist, I think, would be a fair description of it. Yeah. And the, the level of support for the, for, the, for the Values Party dropped quite precipitously. Um, in 1972, it started, and it did very well, given that New Zealand was a pretty rigorous two-party system at the time. But in 1975, when Rob Muldoon romped to victory, um, they did very well. They got over 5% of the vote, which in a two-party system is pretty good. Although in New Zealand, we had social credit, which complicated matters tremendously. So let's just not go there. That's a whole other program. But in 78, they dropped away, and that precipitated a real fight uh, between what you might think as being the classical greens, classical values, all about the environment and no economic growth and you know the perils of modernity, blah, 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 blah. And John Stewart um, and Tony Konofsky and his socialist wing, and the socialists lost. But the victory of the environmentalists did not help because values um, sank away further and further until it kind of blipped off the screen and was reborn in 1989-90 as the Greens. Yeah. And I remember people in ACT telling me, God, I wish we were like the Greens. I don't know how they did it. They covered virtually every single interest group within their electoral um, uh, support, all right? And I don't know whether it was by um, accident or design either, but ACT was right. If you looked at the people who went into Parliament um, in, what was it, 1999, they did cover all of the bases. I mean, you had Jeanette Fitzsimons, the classic conservationist and environmentalist. You had... Dear departed Rod, uh, Rod Donald, um, who had the you know the trade aid, and he had been involved in the whole MMP thing, and then you had the two Reds, you had uh, Sue Bradford, and the late Keith Locke. I mean, yep, and then you had um, uh, I think it was Sue Kedgley, who was all about the food we put into our bodies, and blah 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 blah. And it was just like perfect. The, 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 the seven representatives they got by just and only just cresting the 5% threshold really mirrored the, the, the political coalition um, of uh, green and inverted commas or environmentalist or eco-socialist or whatever you want to call them, you know, because it is a, it's a fairly wide tent, the green movement, but they, they had covered all the bases and it made them extremely effective. But they were all um, very reasonable people. I mean, Sue Kedgley was a reasonable person. I remember joking with her yeah. 
in her office um, when she was banging on about public transport, and I had a meeting with her in her office. And I said to her, well, you're a big advocate for public transport, Sue, but what do you, how do you get to Parliament? She says, oh, I drive, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, they, they all were, and, and among the most radical of them all, Sue Bradford, you know, she turned out to be a very, very effective uh, worker on both sides of the aisle, as they would say um, in the United States. Oh, was her, um, was her um, reaching across the aisle that passed the anti-smacking bill? Not that it was right. effective, but it was still a cross-party um, solution that was yep. that was sought there by Sue Bradford. Yep. So they were a very effective bunch, but but and there's always a but. Um, they were also, I think, a sitting duck for identity politics. And the reason why they were a sitting duck for identity politics is because of the way they make decisions. Yeah. Now, they are a consensus-based decision-making party, although, you know, I, I, I never really buy into that. I prefer to call them a party where the minority rules. <laughs> right? And you know, well, and, and because that's effectively what you've got. And in the early days, and this was a hangover from the Values Party as well. In the early days, they didn't so much have leaders as they had a sort of philosopher kings and queens. I mean, Jeanette really, you know, fitted that description rather well, I thought. They had these sort of serene people whose wisdom was quite obvious to all, and there was a tightly knit group around them. And really, if anything was going to get done or undone, it would be this group that did it. And they did it sometimes publicly, sometimes behind the scenes. Generally speaking, the decisions they made were fairly sound ones, but they weren't made democratically. They were very suspicious of material majoritarian politics. They tended to believe that if you were able to assemble a majority, you were probably a demagogue and that was a very bad thing indeed. And it was better to let wise people rule almost invisibly. And that was pretty much the way things went kind of uh, in it's the green. It's isn't it? You know, it's well, the camp mother yeah, the camp I mean, it, other it, thing, giving you a big hug, and this is what's best for you, and we're going to do this now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of that. I mean, in addition to the Morris dancing, you know, I, I attended a few of these when they would let people attend. Um, you've got to really scratch your head. The Greens, who, who present themselves as, as the new way, as the open, the transparent, the accountable new way of politics, They're nothing these but. days, yeah. if you're a journalist, you cannot get into their meetings. I mean, it's bad enough with Labour and National these days, but you can at least sort of you know hover around. They give you a media pass. You can sit in on the plenary sessions anyway. Um, but the Greens, it's just like a, a brick wall. Um, they'll come out and the leaders will sort of deliver a set speech so that there's something to put on the six o'clock news. But the idea that you, as a journalist, can go in and watch proceedings of this, this party, which, which is seeking to become the government of the country or part of the government of the country, so they kind of are obliged to let people look, you know, um, no, no, you can't get in. But the problem with that consensus-based decision-making, it's fine when the only people playing the game are Jeanette and Doug, her, her, her husband, and, and all these other wise old heads, many of whom were in the Values Party. That's fine. But what if people come in who go, ah, oh, so 25% plus one can stop anything from happening? Hmm. This is interesting. So if we, you know, who knows who we are? I mean, Maori, Pacifica, LGBTQ, plus, plus, plus. Um, if we join the Greens and we dig our toes in, then we can pretty much force the party to tick off all the items on our agenda. 
Now, in the case of Māori, that was made easier by the fact that among the wise old heads, supposedly, were people like Catherine Della Hunty, who had been tireless um, uh, propagandists, is mm. probably the correct term, on behalf of a particular interpretation of um, the Treaty of Waitangi and, and the obligations it supposedly imposed upon the um, colonial people, the Pākehā, whatever. Um, she had been tireless in her um, advocacy for this particular view of the treaty. If you didn't share that view of the treaty, by the way, you simply couldn't get on the candidate list. Mad I mean, there were... Of sway, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, she did. And eventually she got into Parliament as well. But the point is that from the moment the Greens got going, that whole treatyism, as some people call it, was absolutely part and parcel of where they were going. And if, if you were someone who had a good track record in conservation, but you were a wee bit iffy about that particular interpretation of the treaty, well, forget about it. You yeah. weren't going to get on the list. So perhaps you could make a, a, a slightly special case for the treaty and, and Maori issues within the Greens because they were there from the beginning. But the other identity groups which came in were able to use and are still using, as far as I'm aware, the provisions of their constitution in a way which probably wasn't envisaged by the philosopher kings and queens, shall we say. Uh, and we saw this most vividly in relation um, to James Shaw. Yeah. There was no one opposing James Shaw no, but right, when he stood for re-election as co-leader. But 25% plus one voted to open nominations again. And the crazy rules of the Greens meant that even though 74% of the people who were in the room to decide wanted James to be um, re-elected as the co-leader, um, they had to open the whole process again uh, and make the Greens look incredibly stupid because, as I say, it's a party where the minority rules, not the majority. And until that changes, uh, the Greens are constantly going to be at the mercy of minorities. I'll give you an example of just how nuts this gets, right? They have in the Greens now what they call lived experience groups. Right. Lived experience, right? Now, this is all part and parcel of identity politics and intersectionalism and critical uh, race theory and, you know, the whole nine yards of um, extreme left-wing thought in this strange age we live in. Um, the idea is that lived experience trumps everything else, Right. We're not interested in the views of so-called experts. They're probably white anyway, and it's probably Western expertise, which, of course, is wrong. Um, so what we will um, promote above all else is the lived experience of our members. Now, you know, there's a certain attraction to that. You know, if you see academics up at the podium going blah, 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 and then someone steps forward and says, yeah, actually, but I worked at a factory for 30 years, and I know that that's just bullshit. See, in those kind of situations, you think, yeah, fair enough, you know, because what does the professor know when you've got someone who was actually there? And there is certainly, you know, a place for the corrective um, that lived experience provides, especially when you know you've been lectured to by people who really have very little in the way of life experience. It, it um, so but, for the approved groups, because if you're a business person, then your lived experience <laughs> counts against you. If you're your, your lived <laughs> experience, absolutely. Counts against you. <laughs> yes, yes, you're quite right. It, it's only a certain kind of lived experience. Um, yes, yes. Go to the top of the class, comrade. 
um, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's very true. But you can imagine the kind of lived experience that counts in the greens, mm. and this is the problem that Chloe Sprawlbrook is now facing. Yeah. She has made several speeches um, over the last uh, few months where she talks about building the Greens into uh, a vast and unstoppable popular movement, right? I mean, most recently at her AGM, she talked about building the largest Green Party in the world. Lucky Daryl Kerrigan's new party, because he'd tell her she's dreaming. Well... Yeah, I mean, people have been saying that you can build this great mass movement mostly out of the missing million people who don't vote in elections. But even if there were a million people available out there who haven't voted, the structure, the constitutional arrangements that we've just been discussing of the Greens would make it impossible to build such a movement. Because if you've got a mass movement... First of all, you can't have consensus-based decision-making, not in a mass movement. I remember, and you you would remember, in in, uh, its heyday, the National Party Conference would have, what, seven, eight, nine hundred delegates present? More sometimes next year would be even more. We also had 100,000. I I, I can remember the, the victory conference of the Labor Party in 1984, where it was held, I think, in the Michael Fowler Center, and the delegates were up in the mezzanine floor as well as on the ground floor. Um, and I'd never seen that before. I mean, it, it, was, it was a huge conference. Now, trying to get a, a, a consensus uh, in, in a large and vital political movement. I mean, you can get consensus in North Korea. You know, you, you could get consensus um, at the uh, at the level of the whatever they called it in the Soviet Union mm. um, but that's not that's not the consensus I, I think the greens have in mind although you can never be sure um, but if you've got a, a living breathing democratic party and it's mass based then the only practical way of making decisions is to have open debate and then put it to an effing vote. And if 51% votes in favour, then that's the policy. And you can proceed. 49% might be pissed off, but them's the brakes next time. That's the way it's supposed to work. But the Greens cannot do that. The first rule of politics, learn how to count. Absolutely. 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 Um, but, uh, but you see, in the Greens, if you, if you started to get hundreds and then thousands of people signing up, what would you say to them when they came to a meeting? And, you know, a whole lot of people stood up and reckon, I reckon we should do this, or I think we should do that. And the, they got a lot, a lot of cheers and big rounds of applause and somebody, let's put it to a vote. And then the Greens would stand up and say, oh, we don't do votes. And you can imagine everyone looking around going, you don't do votes. Right. Huh. Would they come back? You know, <laughs> would, would they bother to come back? Or would they go home and tell their friends, you know, I went to a green meeting the other day and someone suggested, you know, this, that or the other. And everyone was in, in agreement and, and someone um, moved that it become the policy. And they said, we don't do votes in the green. Yeah, you just can't imagine, you know, even if there was this huge impulse, even if Chloe went out there and persuaded people, you know, on the stump that you had to come and join the Greens. The moment they came and joined the Greens, (laughs) they'd be told, well, no, you you have no ability in this party to have have your will (laughs) enforced uh, or not easily anyway. Well, then with that explanation of how they come to decisions, it, it's no surprise then that they've got all these dud candidates and dud MPs that then fall apart at the drop of a hat because there's there's no sort of Jason E type person in the party who digs into their background and finds every murky dirt that they can find uh, or someone like 
you know, Heather Simpson that vetted all the candidates to make sure that there's not going to be any surprises here. They've got nobody who does that, and they've got these little vested interests and you know, identitarian groups, um, you know, splintering right across the whole Green Party, meaning that all of these, you know, actually plonkers end up in Parliament or people with deep personal flaws. I mean, all MPs have got deep personal flaws, but the Greens are in, have got very deep personal flaws in many respects. So you end up with oh, yeah. Gammons, you, you're Elizabeth Carey Carey, um, you, you know, and now you've got, um, you, I mean, that you had Materia Toure, who, who was, you know, a benefit fraudster, uh, and then you've got um, Darlene Tana now, who's uh, by all accounts uh, reportedly uh, been exploiting workers in the Green Party, the most socialist party we've got. Now, your credentials aren't going to be that flashed then, are you? And and well, this problem that, that's, with the yeah, lead that, also that, who are being radical activists who are having to make decisions all of a sudden that they're not used to making decisions, you end up with a disaster. Yeah. Well, no, that's it in a, in a nutshell, Cam. Um, and once again, we go back to the beginning where you had these wise men and women and the tight little circle around, you know, the, the mothers and fathers or parents of the movement. And the list of candidates, A, wasn't long because getting 5 or 6% was considered a good result. So you only actually had to have, you know, yes. 7 or 8 names. Right. And that was fine because everybody knew everybody. They'd all grown up on the left. They'd all been on the same protest marches. Um, they knew each other, and that was fine. But, see, when you get to be a slightly bigger party and you actually have to have a list that's like 13 or 14 uh, names long, well, then, as you say, you've got to do the vetting. I mean, the, the, the reports have um, uh, Darlene Tana been encountered by someone from the Green Party at Waitangi uh, getting to know one another, and um, it, you know the, the the Green Party person saying, "Gosh, you should stand for the Greens," and coming back and saying, oh, "I met this great person; she'd be a really good candidate," um, and ending up on a list, um, and ending up in Parliament. You know that's that's not the way growing ups behave in politics, you know. That's the way student politicians behave. <laughs> and they've paid the price for that kind of slipshod, ticks all the boxes way of of thinking. It's just been disastrous for them, really. Well, when you when you look back at all the people who have, you know, um, blotted the Greens copybook. I mean in the early days they were amazing. I mean, not only were there no scandals, right, but in Parliament, their conduct was exemplary. They never bad-mouthed anybody. They never insulted people um, in, the in, in other parts of the chamber. Um, they, they stood up and they delivered their ideas as, as well as they could. And they, they, they really did kind of model, you know, um, what was it that Rod Donald used to say? The Greens um, are not of the left. The Greens are not of the right. The Greens are in front, right? I mean, that was the slogan. I mean, and and to some extent, those those particular Green MPs, the ones who first arrived, 1999, they 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 practiced what they preached. And that's always a really, really um, good um, strategy um, <laughs> in politics. The less you practice what you preach, the less success you tend to have. Yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned this lived experience. And, and I wonder if the lived experience, uh, you know, rationale is the cause of their candidates falling apart. So let, let's look at Golrez Garriman, right? She's got a dodgy CV. 
uh, where she claimed that she was, you know, um, this human rights lawyer, but in actual fact she was, you know... Um, <laughs> she was on the defence team for the mass murder. Yes, I know. <laughs> a bit embarrassing. So, and then you've got her... Not, not that every accused person does not deserve a good defence, but it wasn't quite the impression she gave, was it? And and then you've got uh, her fanciful story a bit about being a refugee, which, if you talk to her mother, um, is a, quite a different story. Uh, and, uh, you know, saying that she was living in war-torn Iran when she was actually living in Mashdod, some 900 kilometres yes. from... Yes, from where the, the bullets are flying, yeah. <laughs> um, but her lived experience was that she was a person of colour uh, and a refugee and, and a human rights lawyer. And so she ticked a number of boxes, so yes, you can go on the list. So this lived experience thing is actually hamstringing them and setting them up for failure. Yes, yes. And it's not entirely um, uh, a weakness of the Greens either. I think Labour itself is now suffering from its determination to get gender balance and and uh, tick a whole lot of other boxes um, because... As you know full well, having grown up in a very political family, um, Cam, Cam, you know it's it's a really rough and tumble world, and to succeed, you know, requires, uh, as Liam Neeson would say, a particular set of skills, and they're not that easy to find. And when you find someone that possesses them, you should grab them with both hands. And it shouldn't really matter whether they're male or female or black or white or gay or straight. You should just get them because they're good at it, because they're effective at it. And, you know, this is more and more what is not happening. Uh, and our politics is not the better for it. Well, I wrote an article a couple of days ago and described the Greens' problems as a as an issue of political entropy. So, if you understand physics, the second law of thermodynamics. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything tends tends towards chaos. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> Very <spontaneous> good. <laughs> In a closed system, which you've described, a closed system of the Greens with no external um, observers like media, for example, and then proceeds in a direction that increases randomness or disorder, or as the famous poet Yeats said, things fall apart. And that, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a closed system, the Greens, that's got lots of little parts in it that have grown and grown and grown and generated heat, and it's now collapsing in on itself. But every party has this. It's how they deal with it. And I'm not sure the Greens are equipped to deal with it. I mean, Labor had a case of entropy, um, you know, uh, uh, after um, they won, you know, in 1984. By 1990, it was all over. You know, just six years, it all collapsed mm -hmm. itself. And you, you were part, part and parcel of helping yeah. them bundle them out the door, um, you know, with the new Labor. But you end up, then you end up with a case where you've got the Monty Python-esque situation where these splinter parties then set up and they're all splitters, you know, and then they go through their growth and then end up dying and withering in the political furnace. And, and I'm sitting here bemused thinking this Chloe Swarbrook, who everyone in the media and the left talks up as being this absolute genius, this wonderful person who came third, I mean, anyone else who comes third, it's second loser in, in you know in the real world. But she was held up as coming third in the Auckland mayoralty, and therefore she can lead the Green Party. Well, that's just bollocks. Reality is about to smack her in the bum, and I don't think she realises that. Yeah, to her credit, however, I mean we've got to we've got to give credit where it's due. She won Auckland Central twice. That's not easy to do. Um, uh, at the best of times. 
Um, but uh, it's particularly hard to do when the party that you're representing um, is only, you know, polling, as you say, uh, on a good day in in the upper teens. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I take my hat off uh, to a for not just winning Auckland Central once, but holding holding Auckland Central. I uh, I thought I thought that showed uh, a bit of grit on her part, although her um, her acceptance speech on the night was a little bit strange, um, and. So, yeah, and also, like, you know, we see it in the polls. I don't think the Greens have ever had a leader that's, what, polling 5 6% for the preferred prime minister. I mean, she's got something. She's got some of those political instincts. But honestly, you know, she's in the wrong party. Um, both Labour and the Greens were desperately keen to get their hands on her. Um, after her showing, um, you know, in the mayoral election. And I tend to agree with you. I mean, coming third is like, okay, uh, that's pretty good. Um, But, you know, it's not first and it's not even second. Um, And she wasn't even close. But the point is, there was a real bidding war um, for Chloe Swarbrick, which the Greens somehow won. But I think, uh, you know, when she's uh, no longer um, young and fit and hale and hearty and you know, declining into her dotage, she will, she will look back. Um, and she may say to herself, I should have joined Labour. Because the thing is, it's a tougher fight to get to the top of Labour. But the thing is, once you get there, your chances of actually doing something um, are pretty high. Um, And uh, I just think, you know, this urge she has to be a kind of left-wing firebrand and lead the masses um, to revolution. As I I, um, explained earlier, you, you can't do this in the Greens. It's not that sort of party, you know. The sort of party that changes things is, is you know, the party of, of Michael Joseph Savage, which was a fiery, disputatious, large um, organization, the largest in the country, um, which National, when it was formed after the first Labour government came to power, consciously modelled itself on. I mean, the people who formed National said we must be a mass party. We cannot be a Carter party because that's not how you win in this country. And so they modelled the whole of National's constitution essentially on, on, on Labour's. You know, it had a regional structure. It had a national structure. It had a democratic structure. It was always more democratic than Labour. Um, because it didn't contain the union bloc. Um, and they chose their own candidates, and they had a hand in writing policy. A very different party was formed in 1936 and called National than the party that emerged from the tender ministrations of um, Stephen... Oh, what was his last name? Minister of Everything? Stephen Joyce. Joyce. Yeah, he turned it into a corporation, mm. and any any political party that is a corporation is a corpse. Well, there's no there's no life to it in the national parties. No, like, I mean I can remember when they decided as a corporation they were going to issue a membership card that was going to give you privileges, and yeah. the only privilege that you got from that membership card if you lived in frosty areas was that you had a useful plastic device to scrape ice off your windscreen. (laughs) Well, yes, yes. I remember when um, one of the unions I used to work for um, uh, started started touting what they called 
Um, with less than marketing finesse, the death benefit scheme. <laughs> um, and I thought, yeah, nah. <laughs> uh, this this sounds um, really alarmingly um, like the pension scheme of the Teamsters, <laughs> which, which you know very soon became um, uh, the uh, the dipping bowl of of the mafia. But you know it, that's not what you have unions for. They're not to give you you know um, a, a card and and a and a funeral program. Um, actually, to improve your wages and conditions. But anyway, I digress. The um, the Greens sort of have this. I mean, they're, they're deeply, deeply left wing, um, and it's almost like they've forgotten history. Um, they have this Politburo um, sort of mentality. Um, you, you you know that's that's graduated from a benevolent sort of motherhood of Jeanette Fitzsimons to. Uh, the radical feminist uh, Maori activist and woke, um, you know, goddess uh, leading the party. But they seem there's still a Politburo there, and they seem to forget that most of the members of you know the original Politburo disappeared. <laughs> yes, you're you're talking about the real one. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, it didn't, it didn't it didn't pay to be an old Bolshevik um, under Stalin. Um, there was yeah. there was Lenin, Trotsky, you know, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Stalin, Sokolov, Karen, yeah, and, all of them. Yeah, none of them exist. I mean, Lenin and Trotsky disappeared. And only Lenin and Stalin survived all of that, and Stalin survived the most. <laughs> and so yeah, well, of course, they're, they're you know, looking- Trotsky met his end at the uh, at the point of an ice pick in Mexico City in in 1940 um, at the hands of one of Stalin's uh, um, assassins. So yeah, Stalin got everybody in the end. Bukharin, who was known as the darling of the party, um, he confessed to all kinds of crimes. And uh, and was uh, executed. Uh, Litvinov, who got the most votes, a terrible thing to do when your other um, candidates include um, Joseph Stalin. He ended up getting shot in a corridor. Um, yeah, the show trials went on. Yeah, yeah. Revolutions eat themselves. Always have. Always will. That's ultimately, and it's probably a good final point here that the Green Party have become a party of revolutionaries. The things they talk about are revolutionary, uh, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, they've also got political entropy happening and all that leads to chaos, um, which, you know, the mothers uh, or the female voters of the leafy suburbs of Auckland, which keep the Greens afloat, will start looking with and a little... And and Christchurch and Dunedin, yep. It's one of the one one of the most delightful ironies of the whole green um, history is that while they speak for all of the groups that you mentioned, um, you know, Maori, Pacifica, trans, gay, you name it, um, their solid vote, the vote that keeps them in Parliament. Um, uh, as Richard Harmon, veteran journalist Richard Harmon said, are the wives of the doctors and architects and, and, and professionals of the leafy suburbs of New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for that little uh, history lesson of the, of the Greens. It helps uh, me and certainly will help the listeners understand the problems that are besetting them at the moment. and. I'm, you know, I'm not sure you can come up with a solution for them or I can come up with a solution for them. Um, it's just going to be entertaining to watch, is from my perspective anyway. Yes, well, that's what we political commentators do, Cam. And, you know, one thing you can say about our profession is that it is never, ever short of entertainment and um, issues to write about. Absolutely. Chris Strada, thank you for coming on The Crunch. My pleasure, Ken. My pleasure. No one knows the left in politics like my dear friend Chris Trotter. 
We may not see eye to eye on politics, but strangely, these days we agree more often than not. He has no competition, though, when it comes to the left wing of politics, and it shows. What do you think about what Chris was talking about? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Alwyn Paul is an educationalist and his hot takes on what is going on in New Zealand education are pure gold. He's the perfect person to talk to in order to understand how the collapse of our education system has happened and what we can do to fix it. Let's talk with Elwyn now and find out his views on the latest revelations of the failure of our education system. Elwyn Paul, welcome back to The Crunch. Good to have you back. Uh, Thank you, Cam. My pleasure. You know, whenever there's things going on in education, the person I immediately think about talking to is Elwyn Paul. And uh, you've got a bit of a track record in education. You've set up charter schools operated charter schools, and you are a vocal person on the topic of education. So we've got a few issues in our system now, don't we? Yeah, we do. It doesn't necessarily sit comfortable that I'm the charter school guy. I I, I was interested I met um, Andrew Little, uh, and I'd never met him before, and I happened to bump into him and Russell when I said hello. And I said, oh, my name's uh, Owen. He goes, oh, you're the education guy. And I went, huh, that's a little better than being the charter school guy. So, I mean, I I did teach for eight years in state schools. I did teach at St. Cuthbert's College, uh, established a private school and and was principal at the private school for 18 years and established a charter school. But I I guess, I think uh, it was Michael Laws who called me an education train spotter. (laughs) And, And it has been really influential on my thinking in the last five or six years to dig deep into the data for New Zealand education, and particularly high school education. And we, well, not that I stopped doing it, but uh, an initial dig into that probably sort of 20, 25 years ago it led to, to three conclusions. Uh, one was that we were actually pretty good in terms of our year one to six. You know, it wasn't too bad. Uh, that if you had a child uh, get through to year 10 or, or the old form four in good shape, then they were probably going to do okay almost almost no matter what high school they went to. But that we really did lose the plot for our intermediate and first two years of high school, for which, of course, you know there was no data, nothing you could do. But it has changed, and you know we've now got... A uh, huge disparity between the schools that are producing good results and, and those that are just producing appalling results. Um, and I actually think it, uh, it, it begins with parenting our zero to fives. I, I, that's a big deal. Um, the government, I don't think, has a handle on that yet. You talk about the data and Christopher Luxon and Erica Stanford stood up at the National Party Conference on the weekend. Uh, that's just gone, and talked about an abysmal record in mathematics at year eight. So that's just before you go to secondary school, right? Year eight. Yeah. In, old, in old school terms, form one and form two. Form one is year seven, year eight is form two. Correct. And those numbers that they announced were appalling. Of course, Labor has uh, argued against those numbers. Mm. And said they've got a better number, but it's only slightly better. Uh, but the end result is the majority of students in year eight, and there's no other word for this, as I know it's a forbidden word, it's the F word, uh, failing. Only 22% of students at year eight are at the expected standard for maths. Now, Labor says it, no, no, that's wrong, it's 42%, but either way, the majority of students 
aren't at the standard. In other words, they're failing. And three out of five of those students, or 60%, are more than a year behind. And it gets even worse if you're in the lowest decile schools. I know we're not allowed to talk about those anymore because if you just remove the mention of the word decile, everybody's equal. But 8% of kids are at the curriculum level in in year eight in lowest decile schools. And nearly 80% a year behind in Maori are in a similar boat. What what is that telling us about, like you were saying, you know, you looked over six years and it looked like we were pretty good up until we got to intermediate school and then the wheels fall off. Is this the wheels falling off or have they long gone and we've got a real disaster on our hands that could affect a generation of school children? Uh, well, Chris Hipkins came out I, I, I he, he, that's a that's a forbidden term, isn't it? He didn't he didn't come out. Sorry, I mean I'm not I'm not telling people anything uh, unusual about Chris, uh, but he said in the last couple of days, well, we can blame all this on national, and we can blame all this on national standards. Well, first of all, parents really liked national standards. They were by no means uh, perfect. They. Uh, had far too much um, pushed into them by the teacher unions to have what they called uh, overall teacher judgment. And so you can have a kid, say, do a standardised test, not get a very good result, but a teacher thought they were trying hard and so they would, you know, say that they were uh, at standard. But this has very little to do with uh, national standards. And one thing the national standards did show is that the longer kids were in our schools, the further behind standard they got. And there was a real drop off at year seven and eight. Um, And of course, we can't tell what happened in nine and 10 because we didn't have anything. And we pretty much still don't have anything. Uh, so it could have been worse at year nine and ten. We just we just don't know, and so we, we're kind of picking the end of year eight as a as a little bit of, of a random number, uh, whereas you know, we should have the continuity, which I think is one of the things that National is looking at with these standardised tests. But I, I think it's a bigger issue. And first of all, uh, and, I, and I've said it before on your show, I, I think we desperately need a non ideological. Crown entity for parenting, particularly for during pregnancy, mm. uh, because we've got a really big problem with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and, yep. and other things going wrong before birth uh, that are that are highly preventable. Much easier to prevent them there, than to come up with solutions later in life. Um, and for our zero to fives, <laughs> because that's weird. So much of of the brain is doing its learning development. It's a critical phase. Uh, people might say, particularly between zero and three, but I, you know, I think you can extend that. Where all of the foundations for language and math is a language, uh, and, and the words in mathematics are as important as the symbols. Mm. Um, all of those language and numeracy foundations are laid during that time period. And so you're getting, uh, and you mentioned the lower decile, and uh, it's that's that's statistically proven. Kids in poorer homes, by and large, uh, hear thousands less words every day, and that that's a big deal. So first of all, we have to deal with the zero to fives, and I guess schools, sorry, governments often think, well, schools we can do it, and you know we're more important than parents. They're not. Schools aren't more important than parenting. Uh, schools there to support parenting. But then, uh, you know, you get into our school system. Uh, one of the things that the teacher council has just said that is that uh, teachers, new new teachers or teachers entering the profession have to have level two mathematics. That's actually a really good start. I've only been saying that for about six years. I'm astonished uh, it's not the case now. Well, it's not the case now. In fact, you have to have, you have very little. And I think it was... Well, one of the research uh, people last year uh, did uh, something where it showed that so many, uh, such a high proportion of our teachers feel inadequate in mathematics and in their ability to teach it. 
And so it's the one thing to say, oh, those coming into the profession, but there's going to be a huge lag there. So why not say to the people who are in the profession that over the next three years... Get up to speed. ...will support you to get a level one science, uh, level two English if you haven't got it, and level two math. And I, I that will make an incredible difference. New curriculum's nice uh, if it's good. Um, new methodologies can improve things, although often they freak people out and they put up barriers to applying them. But if you're standing in front of a class trying to teach them something that you don't know yourself, uh, neither you nor the child's got a chance. These numbers around mathematics, is this like the easiest thing to gauge? Because, you know, in maths, there's no in between. You're either right or you're wrong. There's no, you know, show us you're working. Oh, you've turned quite well there, but you've missed the boat. Um, but we're still going to give you a good mark because you tried. It kind of doesn't work like that in maths. Trying on an equation or or whatever mathematical problem exists in trigonometry or geometry or anything else, it requires a right answer, and anything else other than the right answer is a wrong answer. So isn't it easier to assess where we're at with competency in maths? Because you either know it or you don't know it. And if you don't know it, well, that's simple. Whereas if it was history or maths, you've got into um, history or English, um, you know, um, home economics, you've got interpretations of what is right. You know, you've got if you've if you've got sound reasoning in a history uh, essay, for example, you can still score good points because you've backed it up with some evidence and and some things, and you're just looking at it slightly differently from somebody else. So it's more subjective. But maths is not subjective, is it? It's well, yeah. Like and the higher you get, the the less subjective it is. So mm. my oldest did uh, an engineering engineering degree in the US. Well, his calculus exams and and a lot of his other exams. Uh, for instance, they might have three questions, and by three questions, they're not yes answers. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're an hour's worth of work, yeah. and you got 33%, 67%, or 100%. And it, based on the answer that you got, now clearly you have to be really good at the working. So there is a formative time. Mm. When you can encourage kids to, you know, to work through a problem and they can see that they're almost there. So you're identifying where they make the mistakes. And so you, you can receive encouragement and, and, and some credit for that. Um, but yes, ultimately, you want to get the correct number. So it is, in that sense, easier to measure. Um, but there's huge method behind it. Um, so, I mean, I've always taught kids that they ought to be getting 100% in any situation that they are doing math. Now, it might be early on, like when they're learning a new concept, that 100% might require a lot of help. So, you know, you go to your teacher, you work something out, you sit next to a neighbour who's doing it well, and you keep learning until you get it. But you don't give up. Uh, and I often talk to them about, look, math is like uh, you're a mechanic and someone brings a Ferrari into the garage. You make sure that you do a great job. You get all of the help you need. Uh, you clean the car. It looks good. All that sort of stuff. And, and that's that's the approach that you need to bring. The second approach that you need to bring to math uh, is I just have four or five saying with kids that I would repeat ad nauseum. And first of all, math is doable. Uh, you know, a lot of adults have got this huge barrier to math. And you've got those great sayings like, oh, it's different than when I did it. Uh, or when are you going to use that in the real world and, and all of this sort of stuff, which it's the last thing that kids want to hear. Um, or he ha he doesn't have a math brain or she doesn't have a math brain. And there's no such thing as a math brain. So I'd say to kids, you know, first of all, math is doable. Second thing, there are only four operations that you need to worry about. So math is like playing tennis. Tennis, you've got forehand, backhand, volley, smash and serve. Yeah, that's it. And you've got some variations on that, and you have to be pretty darn good at it. But you've only got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Just about everything else is a variation on that. And, and you can break that actually down to two. Well, inverse is math and, uh, sorry, multiplication, division or inverse. 
uh, addition into traction or into birth. So if you perfect that, it's a good start. Then there are rules, you know, just like in tennis, uh, you've got to keep the ball in the court and things like that. There are rules that you need to follow in math. And the key one is the order that you do things in. And then uh, there is language. And it, as the further you go up, there are there are more words or more phrases that can freak you out when you first hear them. So you always say to kids, attack the language. Find out what the word means, because they're not using the word to confuse you. They're using the word to stop you using a sentence to describe something. So it's it's specific. It's a language. And then the other thing, and I, I think it's a thing that we struggle with in life now, and that is you need to do a crap load of work to become good at maths. Uh, you know, you don't walk into a class and absorb it because uh, the teacher tells you one thing. You need to repeat stuff. You need to ask questions. You need to engage in it. So from all of those perspectives, it's not just that um, a lot of our kids aren't very good at math. It, it means that they're not very good at learning. They, they aren't being taught how to go about things to become good. Well, that's where I was going to get to because my experience of maths at school was decidedly average. Mm -hmm. I think I only passed about three or four exams in maths, and from the fifth form onwards, it was a downward slide. Yep. You know, I was scoring, you know, 90 in the 90s in English and history and, you know, other subjects like that. And, and I actually put it down to the teachers that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. I had English teachers that excited me about English. I had history teachers that excited me about history so much so that, you know, everything I do, I always look at a historical or historiosity to look yep. at politics or religion or anything like that. It gives you a good basis. But I had nobody who excited me about maths. In fact, I had the exact opposite of that. I had a world-renowned maths teacher, it's a very famous name, and if I asked you as an educationalist who the top maths teacher is in New Zealand, you'd probably say his name. Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, you know, he, he was a, a sports person, a famous sports person in uh, weightlifting, and then uh, went on to be a teacher in mathematics. Uh -huh. Quite well known. Uh, ended up at McLean's College. But before that, he was at my school when I was a kid. And he was hardly ever in the class. Right. And when he was in the class, he sat up the front and told us which pages of the textbook we were to work through and which page um, of the quiz at the end of the chapter we had to do for homework. Mm -hmm. And that was this world-class teacher teaching maths at one of the top schools in New Zealand. Yeah. I mean, my experience with math at school was was similar. but I So I'd actually dropped it by year 13, by the seventh form, and... In my ignorance, and I'm thankful for that ignorance now, there were two reasons why I chose to do an economics degree, an economics major. One was I thought it would be descriptive and there wouldn't be much math in it. <laughs> and the second one was uh, I, I was terrified of public speaking. So anything that didn't have a seminar was, was a big plus in my book as I went through the university calendars. So I kind of flew through the first year of a business degree and um, opened my textbooks for my major, and it was all differential calculus. Mm -hmm. um, it was I was terrified, and I thought, okay, well, what are you going to do? And at, uh, it was Massey, actually, in Palmerston North when it was in pretty good shape. And, and so I did a course called Methods of Mathematics, and I went right back to the beginning and it was probably the best academic thing that happened to me because I, I had to go back to, to absolute first principles in that and, and also learn how to learn it. Mm. And, it, you know, it took a heck of a lot of effort. But ultimately, my economic statistics uh, paper, uh, I, I think I was the only A-plus in the course. My advanced economic theory was, it was a pretty solid A uh, and things like that. Um, so it wasn't it was an ability. Again, it was it was I think the way I'd been taught. And you know, sometimes when we're at school as a young person, we're not the best students in the world. 
Um, and, and we don't take it upon ourselves to learn, but that's what being a young person is. You need someone to lead you into that situation. And I love teaching kids math. I love teaching them the basics of science. I actually quite enjoy teaching them economics. But with math, you've got that background to it that when they start to succeed, they are delighted because they're doing something well that they've probably heard so many times mm. they won't be able to do. And, and they can fly into it. Um, and we have we have problems right through the levels. One of the issues with NCEA is that you look at you break the course into achievement standards, and the kid goes, "Well, I don't know statistics, so I, I can still get through. I can still get my my sort of twelve to 14, 15, 16 credits by ignoring statistics and doing the other ones." Mm. Well, you know, you're starting to shrink down the size of the course that they're actually being exposed to because if they know they're not going to do it. Um, plus, when you get to universities, a lot of exam sitting and a, a truckload of our kids are leaving school without really having sat an external exam um, because they don't need to. They've already got the credits. So, so as I say, this is not uh, a year seven and eight issue. This is a parenting issue. It's a foundational issue in our schools, um, partially because a lot of our teachers, by their own admission, you know, I'm not picking on them, uh, by their own admission, are, are not good at the subject, uh, afraid to teach it. Plus, we, we don't really measure uh, until it's too late. Uh, and, and then we've got these other issues further up. It's a great subject as well. I mean, you know, you just, you school kids up for a lot of things in life mm. if ultimately they can do reasonably well at the subject. See, the, the thing is, my recollection of schooling is all of bad teachers and the very good <laughs> teachers. I, I, I really <laughs> could count on the fingers of one finger. Uh, yeah. But I'm looking at these results and I'm sitting there thinking, this is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Now, putting aside the parenting issue, because that's a whole other order of magnitude of difficulty to solve. So but it has to be solved. It has to be solved, right? Yeah. But... but uh, in terms of putting a finger on something uh, to to address this, parenting has a role, absolutely, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And, and and we have a societal deficit when it comes to parenting. Yep. Let's put that aside and let's talk about the education system. We always have been told, you know, by various different people that we have a world-class education system, that we are better than everybody else that we have better ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Yet here's a piece of empirical evidence that suggests that that's not the case. And if that's true, and let's accept that it is true, and we, and we can argue about the number, whether it's 22% or 42% or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. right? That's an indictment on the system and those who are in the system that they've, this didn't happen overnight. No. So the very people who have been gaslighting us about whether we've got a world-class system are the ones that are in that system, and you actually have to hold – it's maths, right? It's right or wrong. We've mm -hmm. got 22% or 42% passing. Everybody else is failing. Occam's razor says the system's the problem and the people in the system. Yep. And then, we, then when you start picking into that – You've got a highly unionised workforce. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, about essentially three teacher unions uh, and, you know, for senior teachers and secondary school teachers and obviously the you know, junior school and early education teachers. There's three different unions. And no one's prepared to say, you know what, guys? See that number, that 22%? That shows that you're failing, that your systems are failing. And when you fail, you you don't just get an F, right? And there, there has to be consequences for that. Yeah. And part of that consequences is should be we're not going to listen to you anymore because we've listened to you for the last 30 years since tomorrow's schools came in you know, under David Longy and that was going to solve everything. And here we are 30 years later with worse statistics than when they started. Something's wrong. And yep. you're the only common denominator, and we're going to talk maths again. You're the common denominator in all of this. Yeah. And if somebody does that, the parents of this country are going to go hallelujah. Yeah. 
but I'm not sure that Erica Stanford or Chris Luxon have got the stones or the courage to confront the teachers union about what is obviously a failure. Well, well they have made a start. And, and I think uh, the other day is the first time that Erica Stanford, uh, you know, brought the union uh, failure into the discussion. Mm. Uh, and, and I mean, there are big issues with the teacher unions and, and, I think they need to solve them. I mean, they are going to have a part in the New Zealand education system moving forward. And, and therefore, they need to ask themselves a question. Are they going to have a positive part in improving our system? Or, for example, are they over the next six years just going to bang on about charter schools? Um, and, and one of the, big the answer ones... right now. <laughs> well, I think I know the answer too. They but I still... bang on about charter schools and, and, and that's, raises a really good point now in the yeah. whole discussion. Yeah. The last time we had charter schools, the unions vociferously opposed it. The Labor Party backed them up. And as yep. soon as the government changed and Labor was in charge, that was the end of them. How yeah. are we going to ensure that? I mean, it, it, I mean, I've been looking at some of the submissions on the new charter school, schools legislation, and you've got uh, rote answers. It's mm -hmm. ironic, really, isn't it? Teachers that are, are poor rote learning are teaching their union members to write rote replies to submissions yeah. that all say there's no evidence that charter schools work. But it doesn't take very much effort to to find evidence, such as you know the 2023 National Charter S School Study, uh, you know version three from Credo, which gives you ample evidence that charter schools actually work. Yeah, if you if you go back to the to the union thing, I, I mean, from my experience, I, I think I lasted as a new teacher at Tauranga Boys three weeks in the union before, you know, I, I realised that they were basically just a bullying organisation. I, I got a note from someone in Christchurch the other day who had gone to one of the most recent meetings. He said anyone who spoke from the floor about some of the positive possibilities of charter schools were shouted down. Um, so, you know, is that the behaviour you want in a classroom, for instance? So they don't model behaviour very well. It then didn't take long to work out that in most schools, the person who is the union rep is the person who's going to be most likely to be in need of the union uh, because they're often the most appalling of teachers. And so, you know, you get, oh, I'm going to say the rabble rising to the top and a massive amount of teachers belong to unions just because of the pay negotiations. They don't want all this other nonsense going on. Uh, they'd much rather have a professional association that represented them properly, um, not the situation that we've currently got. And you're right. I mean, their submissions were just appalling. You know, no evidence. Well, I, you know, I can I can give them evidence of schools that I started, schools that Nakai started, schools that Raymond Tipani started that succeeded within New Zealand. I can give them evidence of schools in New Zealand that are designated character, like uh, St. Joseph Māori Girls in Napier, which is in the top 20 schools in New Zealand, despite being a low decile school. Manukura, Palmerston North, also in the top 20 in New Zealand, despite being a low decile school. So these are schools with variation uh, in them, which are also you know, pretty much ignored by the unions. Um, you know, plus they'd say just the usual nonsense, uh, you know, we don't want a system where people can make profit. I think anyone who can make profit out of the charter school budgets uh, really should be the new Minister of Finance because uh, the way it's budgeted for through government, it's it's just not possible uh, to make any anything substantial. And most, if not all, will set up as charitable trusts or charitable companies like I have, mm. you know, <laughs> Uh, that we're allowed to, charter schools are allowed to employ non-qualified teachers. Well, there's 2,000 teachers in the state system on limited authorities to teach. That is unqualified teachers teaching in the state system. And, and so I don't know how they sit there and spout this stuff um, and, and then go back to teach a classroom and ask the kids for integrity. It's almost like uh, you know these are what we we need to oppose this no matter what. There's there's no it's not an educational um, answer. It's an ideological answer. That's right. You know, in, and in the United States, the charter school movement has been 
exceptionally good at selling charter schools to the public and beating the teacher union. Yeah. The way they do it is different, right? They start by having the right people doing the selling. Mm -hmm. Parents and the kids who would be at failing public schools without a charter, right? Yeah. Then that means that they also get, you know, people of colour talking about how the public schools don't serve the community well rather than some of the white funders of the charter movement, right? So you're getting mm -hmm. parents who have got kids who are affected by the public schools doing a poor job saying this is what we want. And then they make the discussion about education a discussion about civil rights rather than an industrial relations issue. Mm -hmm. And then people start to realise that charter schools can be part of the community. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a hugely different, even media tone this time, which is good, because people know that we need this. I mean, the unions, one of the other things they kept saying the other day is that we already have choice in the New Zealand system. Well, they are putting themselves in the place of defending the choice that only the wealthy or the Catholics have. And, and so we have in New Zealand, we have got uh, 2,112 state schools. We have 91 private schools. We have 335 integrated schools, 226 of which are Catholic. Now, to go to a Catholic school, there's a, a significant barrier. To go to a private school, there's a significant financial barrier. Um, and so where's the choice uh, and, and, and where especially is the choice for the kids who don't have any money, who can't shift into the grammar zone, uh, who live in a small provincial town and their parents aren't wealthy enough to put them in a boarding school? Or Catholic or Presbyterian. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think charter schools were hamstrung last time. And that may be an erroneous view, but I felt that the national-led government wasn't that keen on them, and so they just let let it, you know, just sort of gave it lip service, and then consequently it was easier for it to be overturned. But everybody, almost it seems to me that the American way of getting parents who have suffered at, at public schools to front this is the way to go. I mean, mm -hmm. almost all of us have experience of going to school where there were good teachers, very few of them, and bad teachers, a lot of them, and but they were all paid the same. Yep. So there needs to be a case made that the real world means reward for merit and achievement, not for turning up. And if we can do that, that will help us pay better teachers more than the dud teachers. Well, well one of the union people who was submitting actually uh, had to submit after me the other day, and I said, you know, that we paid our teachers more. Then state. He was blown away. He had no idea. I mean, he sort of looked at the people in the select committee and said, well, why doesn't everyone know that? Um, and, and of course, and I mean, if I'm employing a first year teacher and he or she's doing the job of someone who's working at top of the scale, I, I'm going to work very hard to have their income uh, equal. You know, I'm, you're not going to pull down the other person unless they're doing an appalling job. But if they're doing an appalling job, I wouldn't employ them anyway. And and yeah, it's 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 a big deal. You were right. You're right. I, I think national uh, the blowback on charter schools, the the orchestrated blowback on charter schools, uh, bothered them because you know they were uh, really conservative in, in their approach to lots of things, and their main aim was was being perpetually in government, not not improving the country. I think that's different this time. Or I hope it's different, and. I, we, I mean, I'm well aware of a significant amount of the people who are applying to become charter schools. There are some really good applications going in uh, from some strong organisations. And, and so it's going to be harder, much harder for Labour, you know, when, eventually when they get back in 30, 40 years' time, to sort of crap all over them again. See, I look back in history again, you know, I said that earlier, history gives us some good lessons. Yeah. Um, back at, at Obama in 2010, mm -hmm. he was president, and he went to war with the teacher unions. Yep. He came out with a policy which he called race to the top reforms. Yep. Uh, and he was accused of uh, by the teacher unions uh, of scapegoating teachers 
when the problems were more systemic, but he identified it quite squarely. He actually said, no, actually, teachers are to blame here and bad teachers should be fired And if they can't train kids to succeed. It, yep. Listen to the, these words. This is from a Democrat, right? Imagine if we could have these words come out of a Labour Party leader or, or even Mr Luxon. He said, you've got to have radical change. And radical change is something that's in the interest of students. Right. We've got to be able to identify teachers who are doing well. And ultimately, if some teachers aren't doing a good job, they've got to go. Yep. Do you agree with Obama on that? Yeah, I do. Um, it, it, and, and again, it starts at the top. I mean, a lot of schools, will, teachers will say that they're stressed by the amount of uh, busy work that they have to do. A lot of that happens because you've got middle managers or senior managers in schools who who are pushing the busy work onto them uh, because they're kind of justifying a role when they're sitting in an office uh, for nine or ten hours a day, and they've got to think of something to do. So the first thing they think to do is get someone else to do something. Uh, so at least they've, you know. Uh, got some research going on that they can then respond to later. Uh, rather than going around the school and, and dropping into classes and, and doing some work with the kids themselves and all that sort of thing. Um, so, and again, I, I mean, I, I don't think Hipkins or Tonetti really did anything of worth um, as ministers of education. Um, they protected the hegemony of the of the um, of the teacher unions is what they did. Oh, very much so. And I, I mean, I, I I still remain astounded that Ardern stood up when they had uh, passed the law to close down the charter school model, and and she said, as we promised to the teacher unions. Mm-hmm. Or, or, I mean, the families, the kids. Um, all of those sorts of things aren't their first priority. Um, do you do you need good teachers in your system? Absolutely. Uh, and if a teacher is there just collecting their paycheck, you know, go and get another job. Go and pick fruit. Uh, it needs to be your passion, uh, and, and because the children depend not entirely, uh, but they depend on you for for an aspect of their future that you're supposed to be helping them with. Uh, and if you're not, go away. What would happen if the Ministry of Education closed its Wellington office, sacked all its bureaucrats? Do you think the students or the parents would notice? Uh, I, I think the Ministry should have a really important role. And, and uh, you know, not not that I you know necessarily think I'd, I'd ever lead it, but I think the first thing, uh, the new person coming in when Iona Holstead leaves to do is to send a survey to every principal in the country uh, and say, what do you need from us? How can we help you and your school do a better job? What problems do we create in our current mode? Um, and, and those sort of things, because their job uh, is to serve the schools so the schools can serve the children. Mm. Um, and anything that they're not doing uh, in, that, in that realm, they shouldn't be doing at all. Um, and same in a school. If, every, if, if there's anything you're doing that's not actually for the benefit of the kids, don't do it because you exist for the children. That's, that's what a school is. Um, and that's not to say you don't have staff socials, you don't. Uh, you know, reward, reward tech, all of that stuff is about building that that sense of purpose and, and reward for people who are doing things well. But the ultimate aim of that is to improve what they do for children. Mm. Um, and, and so it's, you've got to be really singularly focused. Um, and it's a big deal. Well, you know, hopefully the government is grasping the nettle, to, you know, to coin a a phrase that's often overused. Um, most people actually have never grasped a lead nettle, so they don't know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah. Being a hunter, I have, and uh, it's not pleasant. But it but it looks like they're prepared to beard the teacher unions and say, well, here's the numbers, this is the proof. Show me why this is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and and until you until you can convince me that 
I've misread these numbers somehow. We're not listening to you. Yeah. Well, you've also got to take into account. So it's difficult. Uh, Their aim is by, I think, 2030 to have 80% of kids at standard. Now, that does raise some questions for me because we all know who the other 20 are. And so, look, they're probably the ones that that even Obama would say, these are the ones that we need to lift. Mm. Um, so I think we need to be a bit more ambitious than that. We're, we're also in that situation uh, where we talk about being at standard. There has to be some incentives there for kids to excel mm. as well. Um, so I know it's a it's a it's a sound bite, uh, but there has to be a little bit more detail behind that um, to say exactly how we get there and what that means and how many kids have we actually got absolutely flying on. If, and- if we get to a point where the standard has ninety five percent of pe- people meeting that standard, isn't yeah. it to raise that standard? Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Obviously, you you you, you want to keep improving, um, and our, our foundational teaching uh, is is so important in in so many areas. Uh, you, your scientists to be taught really thoroughly, you know how to how to use the periodic table, and and as you would say, the history of it, how amazing these discoveries have been. But also true science that we still don't know everything about it by any stretch of imagination. They change when we learn something more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and that's exciting. Uh, I mean, I I say to any family, uh, you know, one of the most important books you you can have in your house is Bill Bryson's Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, it's a great read. Uh, he inspires you to look into science, but. Even that, I think it's probably about 10 to 15 years since its release. Yeah. Uh, there's been several updates, you know, because the stuff that was known 10 or 15 years ago is significantly different in many areas. And so, you know, that's why the stupidity of that saying the science is settled. The science is not settled on anything. Just about to raise that because when they, when they, and I was going to say that's part of the, the systemic problem there is in teaching, right? Yes. There would be probably 95% of teachers agree with that, that the science is settled on climate change. Yeah. Or so, anything. So, yeah. so what they teach at their school is not actually science. What they're teaching now is that this is accepted. Yeah. And you, therefore, anything that you uh, have to say against this yeah. is spurious. I mean, I had a problem with that with my daughter. You know, she, she was asked to write a paragraph, I think, in year two or something on climate change. And <laughs> being my daughter, she wrote climate change is a fraud and, and yeah. a few other things. And I got called up by the teacher to discuss the issue, the problem of my child. Right. And I said, well, what, what's the problem? Well, this, she's wrong. I said, but is she? Do you know that? <laughs> is it, yeah. And then is, there's, there's, there's a whole paragraph. range. You know, yeah, did you write a paragraph? Did it have an opening sentence? Did it have yeah. a closing sentence? Did it have some stuff in the middle that supported the beginning and the end? Yeah. Yes. Well, did she write a paragraph? Yes. Well, why haven't you given her 100%? Because she's wrong. Yeah. No, you asked to write a paragraph about a topic. It doesn't matter whether she was right or wrong about that topic. You didn't. It wasn't yeah. a topic. It was about teaching them to write paragraphs. Yeah, I look. I, I love working with kids who who uh, you know we're supposed to be doubters, uh, skeptics. Uh, in, in life, we're supposed to challenge everything. Mm. Uh, and you know, most movies are about that, aren't they? They're about that person who flipping challenges everything. But we hate it in the real world. We and um, I, I mean, I, I was teaching a class once, and um, really cool year seven kids and. Uh, I, if I'm doing the basics of science, I, I, I try and teach it as thoroughly as I can, so it doesn't get have to be untaught later. So, you know, I taught them that uh, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, mm. and then we talked about the variation. So, when you when you go to Rotorua, they tell you that some of the water is 200 degrees Celsius a bit down, and you know the kids go, well, "How the heck is that possible?" It's um, still liquid. Yeah, because it's it's deep down, you know, 
And uh, a poor teacher's college student came in and said, well, we all know that, you know, water boils at 100 degrees. And you had 12 hands uh, go up in there with such rapidity that the arms nearly came out of their sockets. And the poor guy, he didn't know, you know, that it was that one atmosphere mm. uh, and all of these variations. And, you know, to me that, w- that was a little sad because he he got through, I, th- I think, NCA science um, without knowing a foundational truth that's incredibly important. And, and I mean, back to these sort of these submissions. So that's where I, I think the unions have really lacked integrity because, you know, they say, well, this $153 million that's going to charter schools, uh, if that was spent in the state system, and you're like, hang on a sec, it's 0.07 of 1% of uh, vote education. Mm. It is comparatively a tiny amount. And they keep saying, but we could get 700 uh, teacher aides funded through this. Yes, that's 0.03% of a teacher aid per school in New Zealand. If it's solving a problem, find your $153 million somewhere else uh, if that's, you know, if that's the fix. And I just think lack of integrity from these uh, people who would like to be known as professionals is a really big deal for our community, let alone striking, uh, teacher-only days, all of these things that impact on kids that they just don't care about. Political activism, you know, where they get all the kids to make signs and march down the streets for whatever cause the teachers are into. Yes. <laughs> but we could talk for, for hours about this, Alwyn. Yep. Uh, but I, but I, I just wanted to, to give listeners an idea about we have a problem in our education system. We do. The problem rests as much with parents as it does with those who are in the education system. Mm-hmm. Parenting's a big problem. Yep. But the education system has got a, a systemic problem there, and we actually need to look at addressing that. And when you nut it down to it, it ain't the kid's fault. I think that's a that's that's a really, really big deal. Um you you slowly build children uh into taking responsibility. And if they don't, then obviously there's a fault that lies there. I mean, I often talk about school should be a three hundred percent model. You know, you need to convince parents that their child's education 100% depends on them. Have you got them organised? Uh, are you interested? Are you engaged with the school? Because all of those things we know make a big difference. Yeah. You've got to convince your teachers that it depends 100% on them. Yeah. Uh, they have to be good. They have to know their subject. They have to be very caring, which matters to kids. Yeah. A- and 100% depends on you. And then over time, uh, it, it, the kids have got to come up. But when you've got a five or six, a seven-year-old, you know, probably a 13 or 14-year-old, the child isn't going to bring 100% uh, every day. The adults in their lives have to do that. And, you know, uh, it, it's 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 so important. It's so foundational to our society. And if people want to look at it from a financial perspective, as, you know, Cameron Bagri often says, uh, our productivity depends on a good education system. Um, every kid that fails, again, if you want to look at it this way, uh, costs our country hundreds of thousands of dollars oh, uh, yeah. in, in a range of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that seems a very good note to finish this interview up on, that striving for excellence uh, is probably the way out of this. If only we could get everybody to agree that winning's a good proposition. Well, I just think if if you want a winning situation, I, th- I think uh, Christopher Luxon and Erica Stanford have made a start. You know, they 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 stood up. Uh, there was a political aspect to it, but ultimately they were saying something that's really important. Yeah. Um, and 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 now they've got to push on with it. Um, but I think you're right too. I mean, it would be a, a stunning, uh, but the teacher union sh- should stand up and say, "Look, there's a, there's a big heap of truth in this, and we are going to spend the next three, five, six years improving that teacher profession uh, and, and have this kind of driven." But, you know, you 
You touched on it, and I kind of have as well. But I mean, explicitly, if you teach a kid to win, mm-hmm. right, it doesn't matter whether it's sport or a chosen subject. Yeah. If they're used to winning, they want more winning. Well, the neat thing about academics too is, you know, clearly the Olympics are on as we talk, and and it's a it's a one or three winner, depending how you look at it, contest. Yeah. Um, well, academics isn't like that. Every kid in your class can be a winner. Can, can go on to achieve something remarkable that maybe you haven't thought of, their parents haven't thought of, um, but but you can elevate them into a situation where they think of it and they get stuck in. And that's what is rewarding about being a teacher. I've never worked a day in my life because it's just the most amazing industry, I suppose. What do you call it? Uh, sector to be involved in. Yeah, and, and and if we teach kids to seek success and, and enjoy success, you look at sales reps, you know, commission only sales reps, they get their enjoyment from winning, from getting that sale, from getting that commission. Yep. Week week out. Uh if they're not getting commission, they start get, getting grumpy. If they're not getting the sales, they start getting grumpy. But who's who's responsible? That's for the it's the individual. Yeah. But you can be trained into doing certain things that will ensure that you are a winner in your chosen field, whether that's academic or sports or anything else. The people who rise to the top are the ones who are prepared to build that habit of winning. Yeah. And that's how they do it. But everybody can win at, at their own level. But, right. but, but not being able to do maths uh, in year eight, that's, that's not a winning uh, recipe for no, and if you don't, if you don't, if there's no change brought to that situation for that child, you, 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 a large part of their options are shut down, and and that that's the human tragedy with it, and it, it is a big deal, and I'm glad we've made a start. Well, and we've got to have these discussions as well, so that everybody can actually speak up and say, no, no, we want to develop this attitude within our schools, and yeah have agency, at least have agency on behalf of your own children. Yeah. Um, and- well, and, and, and I, um, I mean, these the a lot of these organisations uh, get to sit around a table in Wellington. They call themselves the peak bodies uh, in education. There has to be a parents group um, built into that now. I think that is, that is absolutely crucial. Someone who can sit at the table because School Trustees Association don't do it. Someone who can sit at the table and say, from a parent's perspective, this is what we're seeing. And uh, I think that's crucial. Now on that note, Alan Paul, thank you for coming on The Crunch and talking education with us. My pleasure. Alwyn is so calm and patient, and it shows you the kind of teacher and educator he is. Such wise words on what the issues are and how to fix them. Clearly, we need to do something because what we have been doing in education hasn't worked and has actually made things worse. Tell me what you think. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we'll find out what they think about the astounding revelations regarding our education system and the huge numbers of kids failing mathematics. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Miles. Good to have you back. Hi, Cam. How are you today? Oh, box of birds. Excellent. Topic for today, uh, you may have seen on the weekend the National Party uh, at their conference announced a new policy to do with education, mainly focusing around mathematics. They talked about where 22% of students at year eight were at the expected standard, meaning 78% weren't. Three out of five students at year eight were more than a year behind. 8% of kids at our lowest decile schools are at curriculum in maths at year eight, and 79% are more than a year behind. 
And for Maori, just 12% are at the curriculum in year eight and 76% are more than a year behind. So the government said they're going to do something and the Labour Party's upset because they don't agree with the 22%. They think it's 42% that are at the expected standard, which is, of course, 58% still failing. What are your thoughts on all of that? Well, it's a big red button on my um, back education. I think... um, it's an, an appalling mess at the, at the moment, and that's largely thanks to the Labour Party and their policies or lack of policies. I think the national plan looks good, but educational um, needs need to be met on many fronts. And before any of that can happen, kids have to be in class. And I don't know whether you can remember, Cam, that amount of truancy and absenteeism, those levels were reported earlier in the year and they were staggering, if you remember. Well, yeah, I mean, you can't you can't be at the required standard for mathematics or indeed any other subject if you don't go to school, right? I mean, it's just super bright and you can That's teach exactly yourself. right. There's bugger all people that are in the same league as me, is there? Or you, in fact. Um, you know. Well, the, big, the, pro- the problem that I see is if they don't fix the truancy and absenteeism, and that was largely ignored by the Labour government, if they don't fix that or try and do something with that alongside the curriculum announcements, then it doesn't matter what curriculum announcements you actually enact or or get um, done because the students aren't in classrooms and if they're not in classrooms, they're not listening, they're not learning, they're not doing mathematics. So that would be my first big thing is let's make sure that the educational initiatives announced are rounded and kids actually get into the um, classrooms. I mean, it's a huge issue in truancy, but I mean, these are appalling statistics, even if you take the generous uh, read of the statistics by the Labour Party where they say just 42% are at uh, at the required standard, meaning 58% are failing. That's an indictment on our union-protected education system that the Labour Party continues to protect the unions at. I mean, clearly, if you look at those statistics, the union system of education is failing. And yet when the union do something about it with charter schools or something, guess what? We get the Labour Party, the unions, and every other man and his dog who thinks they know how to teach children saying, oh, no, it can't be done. Well, what they're doing isn't working, so why don't they just shut up? The unions have had um, the teaching profession by the throat for many years. And sad to say, the levels of um, achievement have been rising. Not at all. They haven't. And if they are not um, rising, what's happening? Oh, I, I'll tell you what, everything is protected by the union. So we can't make any initiatives. We can't make any changes. It seems to me that the union is actually intimately involved in the decline of the educational standards. And when I said a well-rounded um, approach, starting with truancy, I also think we need to actually look at what the unions and the union protected um, curriculum is doing. For a start, I think there's only a a precious few hours in the day that teachers are in front of students. And I want them to be doing mathematics. I want them to be doing English. I want them to be learning science. You know what I don't want them to be learning? I don't want them to be learning te reo, which is going to be useless. In the real world, I actually think that if there is um, a place for Tereo, it needs to be an option, and plenty of people will take that option. But I think science, I think mathematics, I think English, these are the skills we really need to focus on to bring them up to speed. Because without that, our education system is going to fail more than a generation of school children. I think it's already failing more than a generation of school children. If they've got to year eight and they're behind, then there's a good chance that every year subsequent, you know, behind them uh, in year seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, 
are also behind. And then let's look at the year nine students, 10 and 11, and have a look at them and see where are they placed? Because, you know, this hasn't just magically appeared out of nowhere. You don't go from, from you know, good past you know, levels of, of uh, competency in mathematics to just 22% having competency in mathematics, uh, you know, in a New York minute. It doesn't happen instantly. It exactly happens. Exactly right. How long has this been sliding for, and why hasn't anybody done anything about it? Well, I think the answer lies in the uh, the control um, that the union has of the teaching market and any innovations. Uh, look, let's be quite clear: anything that the National Party suggests, good or bad, in fact, anything at all that they suggest in education, will be opposed by the unions. And that is nothing more than an ideological position. The unions are really demonstrating that they're uh, past their use-by date, in my humble opinion. Not fit for purpose. That's what in my humble opinion, that would be exactly right. So, therefore, we need to actually get a, a broom and sweep the floor clean and start again. And I have to take my hat off to see more and act. Charter schools proved their worth, and, I mean, hell's bells. Let's actually get back to a system where the school is doing the basics right, and if the unions can't accept that, then the unions need to go. Well, it can't be soon enough for me. Um, you know, I, you can't put the blame on anyone else other than the, the system, the education system, and all of the teachers that are in it. And I'm not um, attacking individual teachers, but I am attacking this predilection for Labour and the teacher unions to always say we've got a world-class education system. Well, the evidence is before us, and, you know, it's mathematics, so you, there's no grey areas. You're either right or you're wrong. And at 22% at a meeting standard, I'd say we don't have a world-class education system and if they can show me evidence otherwise, I'm all ears. But right now I'm looking at abject failure uh, for a generation at least, possibly more. Decades of ideology. That's what I chalk it up to. And I think that needs to be broken. That pot needs to be dashed. And we need to look at an all-round system. And I think the charter school model has shown us that when ideology is gone, kids flourish. And I think you're absolutely right on that, Miles. Well, I've got Lindley lined up following you, so I better go to her. Thanks for your call, and we'll talk again next week. Goodbye, Cam. Have a good one. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Lindley. Good to have you back. Hi, Cam. Yeah, it's good to be here, isn't it? Lovely and fine down here, except for the frosts. Oh well, you know we've got a. It's called winter. We've got, we get that every year. I know, but I'm increasingly becoming a sissy. <laughs> Bit cold in the morning for your early morning runs or cycles or whatever it is you do in, early in the morning. It is, yeah. Well, did you? I don't know. You saw on the weekend the National Party uh, announced that they were going to uh, start to fix uh, the teaching of mathematics, and they used some numbers. They said something like twenty-two percent of students in year eight were at the required standard uh, for mathematics. So, you know, that's a large number that aren't, uh, a very large number that aren't. Uh, and they've also said that three out of five students in year eight are more than a year behind, and the numbers are even worse for Maori with just 12% uh, at the curriculum level for year eight, and 76% are more than a year behind. Of course... Uh, the, the Labour Party come out and said, oh, those numbers are, are dodgy. You know, it's not 22% are at standard, it's 42%. Like, waha, it's better than it is. It's still 58% failing. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. And do you think the problem is just in mathematics or is it probably in other subjects as well? Well, um, <clears throat> before I say what I think think it is, what about this figure for your three, three from five that are behind um, in their curriculum, that, that equates to 50,000 kids 
So there's 50,000, if you can imagine them standing in a football field, <clears throat> that can't do their maths. No, it would fill it's Eden, pretty horrifying. It would fill Eden Park. Absolutely horrifying. But, um, hey, um, well, Christopher Luxon has really said most of the things that I believe myself, and I totally agree with him that this is an appalling total system failure. It's been coming on for many years, really. Um, and he's absolutely right that progress needs to be assessed. See, they've taken away exams because that's naughty to um, make people accountable for their results, isn't it? You can't have that. No, exactly. So that's been taken away in the place of this NCAE business. Um, but he's right. You can't address what you can't see. You've got to measure it. So I'm right behind them on all of that. Um, and like many of their things, I appreciate that they've made a start, but to me it's never enough. But do you think he realises the entirety of his quoted total system? Because where does it start? Well, <clears throat> I've got the breadth of time on my side and I've seen it. And I think it started with the breakdown of the family unit. Um, the parents or parent no longer taught the children to read, write and count before they started school. Uh, that's a privilege we all had. And the grandparents, of course, who often did that, they're far away in a rest home, aren't they? And the government's nanny state has taken responsibility for total education of the children while the parent or parents um, are at work. It would appear they've done a poor job of it as well. You know, if the state ever does they've anything, it. they always do it badly, don't they? They do do it badly, Um and, and this is what's showing um, now. And in that time, you see, the discipline of children has been very much discouraged uh, to the point where many are disruptive in the class and, and they cannot be controlled. The teacher's not allowed to um, th throw, throw the uh, blackboard duster at them anymore. And the kids, those kids see no value in schooling. And pretty soon they're not, not attending school, they're truant and roaming the streets like ferals and <clears throat> those are the ones that are being lost uh, you know from being valuable citizens I, I do think it's absolutely tragic Chris Hipkins of course he was the um, Minister of Education wasn't he and <clears throat> he's blaming the previous national government but he hasn't fixed this dire situation in six years he's had a fair crack at it have you seen his New Zealand curriculum's vision for young people. That's worth reading. Uh, it's 156 words of fluff that covers everything bar academic education. It's got every bit of ideology in it you can imagine. Have you well, seen that? Well, it's not, I wouldn't call it a vision. It's more myopic, um, actually, um, with, a, with a bad case of astigmatism. It certainly is, um, but you know, it's listed as a vision. It's just unbelievable the rubbish in that six years that these people have put on their online websites. You know, I guess that's where quite a lot of the bureaucracy has been overemployed, I would think. Labour's education spokesperson, Jan Tanetti, who is an ex teachers union boss, uh, was the Minister of Education in the last years of, of the Ardern Hipkins regime. She says she's angry that the government has uh, used, in her terms, erroneous figures. And um, she prefers oh. that 42% rather than 22% of kids in year eight uh, are achieving at standard without even a shred of sort of decency to understand that even that number shows that 58% of, uh, of kids in year eight are failing mathematics. Yeah, well, I'd go even further. She's dead right that um, they're erroneous figures. They'll be a darn sight worse than what they have actually said. That's what I believe. Just, just unbelievable. And let's not forget when the teachers were surveyed two years ago and they couldn't answer the maths question of if you had seven flies and you needed a total of ten, how many more would you need? The teachers couldn't answer that themselves. Well, I suppose you'd have to an answer whether or not some of them are trans flies. <laughs> well, I dare say they are. <laughs> Gender benders. 
Yeah, some of them poo poo yeah. um, that we're identifying as flies. And then, you know, we can't really answer. See, in my book, math says you're either right or you're wrong. You can't be almost right, you know. No, you can't, but I mean they have lots of sort of puzzles with algebra and that sort of stuff, don't they? Um, I think nowadays they sort of mark them for, even if they didn't get it right, they mark them uh, for their process and trying to get it right. See, they have they've broken down education totally until it's just a joke. I don't know whether it's deliberate or not, but as more and more time is given to teaching kids that they will either burn up with climate change or be drowned in sea rises, that they may be a cat or even an aberrated sex they've never heard of. And then there's less and less time to spend on worthwhile education and create self-esteem because a lot of these kids um, are very anxious. I've seen three cases in the last week of uh, kids who've climbed into their parents' car in the middle of the night put their foot to the floor and uh, sped along the road on the wrong side of the road and two of those have killed people that they've banged into. Mm. And they, they've been chatting suicide with their friends, you know, online and they've even carried their phone with them and photographed themselves driving along the road like that. Uh, and, of course, the inevitable's happened. They've killed somebody else. But, you know, these things shouldn't be going on in their minds. Well, uh, you know, I put it down to uh, social media, actually, where you've got even adults mm. who are sitting there getting absolutely every piece of their information about life from Facebook and X and TikTok and God knows what else. And they sit there doom scrolling through all of these things and they get this perception that the world is this horrible, awful place when an actual mm. – the world's a beautiful, vibrant place. If only you take your head out of your phone and your ass, and um, have a look around you and learn to enjoy yourself uh, in the here and now, uh, rather than fretting about the alarm, you know, bells that are ringing about climate change and wearing masks and all that sort of bollocks. And I think people just need to turn their phones off and start having putting their head outside the door. And uh, going for a walk in the fresh air and finding out that, that life's actually wonderful and beautiful, if only you would have a care to take notice of it. They do, and um, I think this um, a action plan, they're, they're actually taking their phones off them, aren't they, while they're, while they're in class anyway. That's a start. Oh, well, I mean, uh, they, But they do get addicted. They, they do get addicted to them. They do get addicted to them, but, you know, again... Uh, National said we're going to you know, stop using phones in schools and all of these Karens out there in the Labour Party and the teaching and so on, this is terrible, this is awful. You know, what if they need to ring home? Well, I never had a cell phone when I was at school. I dare say you didn't either. In fact, you're probably damn lucky if you could use the school phone, which only had one line. Uh, and and well, we all managed to cope without having, you know, you know, this micromanaging of their entire life via their cell phones. It's just ridiculous. Well, it's part of the problem. I mean, uh, the way that things have changed, that's what I say about uh, Lux and, you know, does he really realise he's saying it's an appalling total system, which, which we agree on, but does he realise how big that system is? Because it's huge. It's not like you and I were at school. Um, you know, we had a life before we went to school, really, and it was good to go to school. A lot of them don't even want to go to school now. And I see them um, up in our town, and it doesn't matter what time of day you, you go into town, you'll, you'll stumble across some of them traipsing around the um, takeaway food places and that sort of thing. Shirts hanging out, you know, ties halfway around their necks and... Uh, just absolutely no values at all. The lack of focus on life is really worrying. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's always been a moral panic. I can remember when I was a kid and the talk around parents and, you know, schools was the terrible advent of spacey machines and takeaway bars. You know, we were going up, <laughs> putting 20 cents in and, you know, failing dismally at gal galaxians or Space Invaders or, or, or you know, Pac-Man or something like that. Um, and this was this moral panic, and now we seem to see all this moral panic about other things like 
oh, vaping, you know, it's terrible they're vaping. And I always just say, well, would you rather they smoked? Yeah. Well, heck, you know, I, I think I've see, seen a wee bit more of life life than you, Cam, and I can go back to um, when if you went, or if I, being a female, went into a milk bar, I would be classified as a slut. Mm. And I didn't even know what that word meant, but I knew it was something not very good for a while. <laughs> but um, no, they just traipse around the town now. But anyway, there's one other interesting thing which I have experienced myself in the middle of all this thing. Um, the intro of computers and devices uh, in line with maths. Uh, once you get that, your brain knows where the answers are, and that's on the uh, device. Well, that's and right. It definitely affects um, your ability to do maths in your head because your brain has learned. No, I don't need to retrieve it from my head. It's on that screen, and you just can't remember them. And, you know, I, I know somebody who uh, had a career as a um, sales rep, and he, he could reel off maths in his head while he was stitching up a deal. Unbelievable. And that was only because he had to do it. He he couldn't stop in the middle of a deal and get, get his um, calculator out, you know. Well, um, yeah. We were at school, and you're probably at school a little bit uh, earlier than me, but we were taught our times tables and various other maths uh, by rote. And we all know our tables, at least up to the 12 times tables. We know automatically what 12 times 12 is or 11 times 12 or 10 times 9 or whatever. We know that inherently in our system. It, we retrieve it, it comes back, the answer is instantaneous, it's faster than any kid can do on a calculator, and yet we're told that that's not the way that we should learn. They need to have hugs. No. They need to have cuddles, you know, a sprinkling of unicorn farts, and and then they'll learn, <laughs> you know. It, and it's- <laughs> yeah. But you'll find if you take that... Um- device away from them and uh, you see all the tools you know if if the young people get a job you know at the supermarket or something even all the tools tell you you know how much change that sort of thing they're actually never having to work out maths at speed in their heads so that's the only way you can learn to do that I think that has a big effect as well I think there's so many factors in this um particular topic you could go on forever about it but the figures they've come up with are absolutely appalling oh they are appalling they're an indictment on the system they're an indictment on the union controlled system and uh and really you know if the labor party or the teacher unions speak up and say something we should actually just you know um discount what they've got to say or just you know, put a filter on somehow so that all we ever hear is from them, you know, because that's about what the uh, what use their their statements are. Well, they're hopeless. And do, do they realise um, this is a, the best that I could work it out, mind you, um, 246,000 unemployed under 24 years of age? And we know that that's not the real figure. That's only the figure of those who have actually registered and say they're looking for work. It doesn't count all the ones that are sitting on their butts doing nothing. These people we're talking about now, they're going to go out into that system uh, and try and get a job. There'll be um, AI will be a lot more advanced then. There'll be less jobs still. And... We've got, I mean, our factory jobs have all gone to China and Vietnam and Mexico and everywhere. So they can no longer just hop into a factory job. But do the teachers' union that are so clever, do they realise of those future outcomes for those kids? I don't think they do because those kids who are looking for jobs, we now know they can't count. And we also know that most of them mm. don't know their Arthur or Martha. That's right. Anyway, I- I've got uh, Paul waiting, so thanks for your contribution again this week, and we'll talk next week. See you later. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Great to have you back. Thank you. Great to be back. I've got a real bit of a little conundrum for you, and I know you've got a bit of an interest in education. Um, You would have seen over the weekend, or maybe not, you might have caught up with after you've got back from overseas, but the National Party's come out and said, we've got a problem in maths education uh, at year eight. 
Uh, uh, only 22% of students are at the expected standard. Uh, three out of five are more than a year behind. Uh, at our lowest schools, only 8% of kids are at the curriculum level maths for year eight. And 79% of them are more than a year behind. And for Maori, 12% are at the curriculum and 76 behind. Now, I know that you're on a couple of school boards, so I'm very interested to see what you think about this revelation and the po possible solutions that we should have. Well, it's, um, what I find is very interesting is the things that are the root causes of this is absenteeism from school. And so... Um, and we don't even measure it in a way that is readable or understandable. So we measure it in by saying, because um, I think in the last three years, our um, attendance stats have dropped from 70% down to a 40-something percent. And, and, but what they mean by that is 40% of kids attend school more than 90% of the time. And so um, you, you can't really get to the bottom of it unless you look at the actual numbers on there's a, there's a, um, a school um, dashboard, if you like, for, for schools. And um, so in primary school um, and then secondary school up to year eight, so um, if you're going to a primary and an intermediate school, sorry, up to year eight, those kids, uh, if you look at where the band where they should be in, in year seven, I think they should be at the beginning of level four, and at the end of year eight, they should be at the end of level four. Sorry, at, at, they should be starting level four in, in in year seven. So year seven and eight, or form one and two, uh, as we used to know it, they're, they're quite tough years for kids. And if I tell you something in, in today's lesson builds tomorrow's lesson, and so you have to know today's lesson to be learning about tomorrow's lesson, and 60% of the kids aren't coming every day, they end up with gaps. And when they end up with gaps, the, the questions are often, um, like if you were to look up, there's a, there's a classic test, if you were born five years ago, how old are you? Or if you're 22 years now is, is what they do to throw a red heading in it. If you were born five years ago, how old are you now? And the answer is five. You were born five years ago, you're five. Well, listen to them, the number of people, like these, I think there's 38 answers for that question that they've, that they've given, you can see on YouTube and all these sorts of stupid things or Facebook or whatever. And what they're saying is they can't even get the English of the question. So many math questions are determined by how well you speak English. And so in the school that I'm on the board of, we've got a lot of people who are ESOL kids, so that they, um, they don't have English as a first language. And as such, um, if you can ask them their question in their native tongue, they do way better. And so... Is the maths the failure or is the English the failure? And, and you, you would see, um, like, one, another thing you can look up on the internet is kids are being asked, what's three times seven? And they say 21. And someone says, what's seven times three? Oh, I don't know. You think, and these are kids that look like they're about 15. And you think, how could you not know that? Well, again, it's the way things are often phrased. And so if they learnt it one way and they don't realise that the opposite is, is the same thing. So, and, and there's a whole lot of tricks to maths that n the teachers don't even learn. And so when the teachers don't learn the tricks to maths, they don't on-teach them. For example, you can ask anybody that's sort of related to me, their 11 times table up to just about any number you like. And you say to them, what's 11 times... 39, and the answer is 3, add the 3 and the 9 together, makes 12, so it's 4, 1, 2, uh, the 4, 1, 9. So, sorry, 4, 2, 9. And so, or if you go, what's 11 times 33? It's an easier one. So 11 times 33 is 3, 6, 3. So you add the 2 and together, and if you have to carry the 1 in your head, so, so be it. Well, 
our kids didn't get taught that. They get to learn right up to 12 times 11, and that's what it is. And a few schools were going up to 16. Very few went to 20 for rote learning. But that maths, rote learning, or arithmetic, as we used to call the easy parts of it, um, that holds you in good stead for a, a lot of um, your education in all sorts of things that you're doing. You know, like someone says to you, what's your wages? And you say, oh, um, I'm on $20 an hour. You can just have it and say, oh, um, for a year, that probably puts you on a, um, something like 40 thousand. You know, you double it and, and that puts you on. And so you get all these easy ways of doing things if you want to work, work things out. And so that, you know, 40 is 800 a week, 800 a week um, gives you 40,000 a year. So those are things that are easy for for people to work out if they can just remember half and double. And and so that there's lots of these tricks that you can get for everything. Um, but our kids aren't even learning the basics. And it's because of truancy is my belief. My belief is the kids don't go to school every day. There's gaps in their learning, and when there's gaps in their learning and this one subject builds on the next, or the previous, sorry, um, they'll struggle. Yeah. Well, they certainly will. But does this point to a, a systemic problem in our education system? Uh, every time somebody tries to do something to fix it, they actually make it worse. And whilst we've got uh, truancy uh, happening, that's a given we're going to have poor outcomes for kids. But isn't the problem deeper than that as well, in that we've got an education system that we are told repeatedly by the teacher unions, the Labour Party, and anybody else who has an opinion on this, that we have a world-class education system. But the numbers I'm looking at suggest we don't, and that that's a lie. Mm. Well, they do say that we're we have got a world-class education system. Um, it doesn't look like it to me, but on the school that I'm on the board of, I've really pushed for the basics and I've really pushed for attendance. So if you if the attendance is low, um, we, we phone home, we contract the kids at the beginning of the year to make sure that they um, are written down and contract that they're going to come to school every day, that they're not unwell. And, and so on. And then our teachers really love the kids and know them all individually. So we've got a decile, well, what was a decile one school, performing at 80% plus NZCA. And you look and you think, these kids are doing it. Now, we, I think we've got three European children at the school and we've got 360 kids on the roll. And most of them are Maori, Pacifica, or um, there's a few um, uh, from some of the um, Philippines or things like that. And, and you look and you think, these kids, most of them don't have English as a first language, but when you work with them and you study with them and you work on them, and we're having the, um, the Ministry of Education come and say, oh, let's have a look, what's, what are you guys doing that's different? And they want to know and they want to ask us some of the things, that some of the strategies that we're using. But what they have done just recently, which I think is, it breaks my heart really, is they've said, oh, because your kids are now as successful as they are, they've cut our poor people funding. So we get less funding now based on our results. So when the teachers work hard, because if you're a decile 10 school, you get way less funding than if you're a decile 1 school. But now that they've changed, this, so there's, there's no deciles, they're saying... Um, depending on how well you do. So we're losing quite large amounts of money because our school under the senior leadership team have worked so hard, got the right teachers on board, and now that they're um, succeeding, they're cutting our funding. That's, that's us backwards. Now, in the business world, <laughs> if you've got a sales team and you've got one person who's hitting budget exceeding all, you know, selling more. And this is the Pareto principle where 80% of your sales are produced by 20% of your salespeople. Which ones paid the most in the real world? Well, it's, the, it's the ones who achieve the most, right? You so, would hope, yes. So, um, you know, you, you wonder how the school system seems to think that the ones who achieve the most get the least. It, it's bizarre. <laughs> well, that's... 
it's bizarre. But also, if you add to that, the fact that the teachers are all, like if, if you look at what they're being taught at a lot of these places, they're being taught a whole lot of woke ideology. And they're being taught that you've got to have quite a few rounds of holidization and how bad it is for our, our people and all these sorts of things so that they're spending a lot of time learning things that aren't going to help them. Like our school just recently really kicked butt in um, the band competition that was run, they had the Battle of the Bands type thing that from all over the world happened in New Zealand and it was hardly even getting a mention. And our school won um, a category. And you can't generalise, but what do a lot of Polynesian people do? Well, they sing well, their instruments well, they dance well. It, and a, a lot of if you can feed to the strengths of these people so they have some good successes, whoever they are, whatever group they are, they've got some raw talent that if you feed into that, they get successes. And then you, with those successes, move them over into the curriculum that we need so that they don't feel like that they're failing at a lot of things because they're succeeding at a lot of things. Success breeds success. And the next thing you know, um, the kids are doing well. Now, not all our kids do well in mathematics, but a heap do well in mathematics, like way better than the national average. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. It's it's astonishing. And uh, all power to you now, and that school that you're uh, on the board of, Paul. Um, you know, that's huge success. And what we need to do is actually start picking people's brains that are people like you rather than listening to the teacher unions. What is also interesting is, the kids come to your school, so our school here starts at year nine. The kids come with year eight education, and some are at level one and level two of maths, and that's year two and three, and very few are at um, level five, which means they're above. And so we're taking kids, and, and what I've always said to our um, staff and our leadership team we need to raise them more than a year's worth in a year. So if you're a level two, well, you've got it tough, but I want you to be more than whatever you would normally do in a year. I want you to do more work than that in a year. And even though you're still below or well below, you have big ups and big praise in my book because you've achieved more than a year's worth of growth in a year. And we're trying to show them and make, you know, show them and teach them how handy some of these skills are and this is how you use maths elsewhere. This is what interest rates work like. This is what if someone says how much do you pay for a week to buy a particular car on higher purchase what does that mean full price compared to what? So we show them real world examples of how maths can work for them, how interest rates can work for them and these sorts of things and the kids kind of get it when you can relate it to something that they're interested in well, especially if you can teach them the difference between margin and markup, because as soon as they understand even that easy one, yeah, give them that easy one, which which so many people fail at. Um, you know, I, I always add to it when I'm teaching somebody that that um, markup means you go broke, margin means you make profit. Yes, exactly. And what's the difference between a third and a half in the same world? You know, if you've yeah. got a fifty percent margin, then you're selling it for a three rather than a two. If you've got a fifty percent markup, you're selling it for way less. You know, it's a it's a it's a quarter more or a third more. And so all these things people don't get unless they realise that, you know, you get two apples and you trade them for three or you get three apples and you add one more making it four and you think, well hang on, they're they're much different numbers. Um three quarters of four is different than um, two thirds of three, and and you're trying to say to people, look at it's so easy, it's so obvious. If you could just get your head around it, it it's all good for you. And many of our young people are of a belief that they can't make it. And sometimes at at the school that I'm at, we have problem children, and the principal might go and check out what's the story and call them in, and they, they haven't eaten any food for four days other than the lunch that supplied them at school but yeah. they didn't eat anything over the weekend because they're out of money. Well, these are things that are real issues in some of these lower lower value um, areas or these people where there's, where there's poor people, but the kids have still got 
like they smile a lot, they've got great brains, and we can teach them amazing things. And they don't have to be um, failing at maths. No, it, 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 as I said to Miles and to, to Lindley before, maths is either right or wrong. There's no middle ground on it. So if you can get them to get it right more than they get it wrong, then their life's going to improve significantly. Mm. I heard recently that maths is a racist concept. Oh, yes, it's terrible. Jack will be waiting. I'll be uh, <laughs> to hear what he's got to say about the education system. Okay, all good. Take care. Sorry if I've raved on. <laughs> right, Paul is gems of wisdom. Thank you. Bye for now. Welcome back to Cam's Buddies, Jack. Good to have you back. Good, Cam. So the topic this week well, is about education and, in particular, the abject failure of the school system to teach kids mathematics. The National Party has decided they're going to do something about it. They said that apparently only 22% of year eight students, well, kind of form two in old school, uh, are able to do mathematics at, at a sufficient level. So what are your thoughts on that and what should we do to fix it? Well, they can talk all they like, but this is not a new thing. I was educated in the late 50s and uh, the mid-60s, and um, I can remember my father, who was in the RNBDF, got posted to Singapore during the Malayan emergency, and for three years, 56 through 58, I was educated in an English school run by the Royal Air Force. When I came back, I went into the same class that I'd left before I went away, and same people there, and I was light years ahead of them. It was, so, it was so embarrassing that um, they took two more years to catch up. I was ducks of the uh, school, and I won a scholarship to go to Nelson College. And really, it's only because all the other people were so dumb. Now, since then, we've dumbed down the situation to the point where there's no the way the word failure has been taken out of, I don't know, uh, the English language. No one's allowed to fail. I mean, in England, at age 11, you have to pass an exam called the 11 plus. That determines whether you pass or fail or can get to a grammar school or a secondary modern. Your, your life starts there. But over here, no, it's set on the standards of the lowest common denominator. Nobody must fail. And of course, that's why there's a lot of trouble in schools. The bright ones, you were telling me yesterday, um, how you were a bit of a larrick in at school because um, basically you were bored. Because it's all education now is position for the lowest common denominator. Well, unless we change that, we are stuffed. Now, I can remember during the 90s, I was asked by the education department, I think it was, to write the subjects for the NCEA examination for uh, the photographic industry to get a certificate in digital imaging. And it's very nice. They kept flying me down to Wellington. God knows why. What a waste of money. I said, I don't need to be flown down there. But no, they insisted um, but it was pretty good because it was ANSAT Airlines and the hosties were so pretty and the food was so good. It was really good. Anyway, I kept writing these subjects and then they were being uh, uh, vetted by a professor at Otago University who kept saying to me, oh, no, it's too hard. You need to sort of um, you know, bring it down. No one, this is a guy who knew nothing about the subject I was writing on, I should add. kept saying, oh, no, um, you know, you need to make it uh, easier. I said, do you actually know the question? Can you answer them? Oh, it's not my topic, he said. Anyway, I go on. Um, it's quite depressing, really. I think um, the schools here catch up sort of uh, later in, you know, um, high school, um, most of them, some of them. Uh, but in the early years where it all matters, nah, hopeless. Well, you know, you you touch on a couple of interesting points. I mean, when I was growing up, I was taught that coming second was first loser. Excellent. Right? So who wants to come second? It's not winning, is it? Now you've got all these people celebrating that they came second or third in the Olympics, and I'm thinking, yeah, but it's not gold. Like, no one remembers who came who came. It's a, bit, it's a bit harsh, but I understand where you're coming from. This is a bit harsh, but they do. it's nice. You know, like, and then they'd say, oh, we're not going to keep score in, you know, for this this game of football. And I said, well, you know, if winning wasn't... I know, I know. If, winning, if winning's not important, why do they keep score? You know, so... I'll it, tell you, when I, I was a cricket coach at the Cornwall Cricket Club, and they, they told me, because uh, I was a new coach, 
but they had, they had to enjoy the game. So I sat them, all the kids down, and I said, OK, I've been told to tell you that um, you were to enjoy the game. Um, and that's the only thing you need to know. And I then said, how do you think you're going to enjoy this game the best? And all the hands went up and they said, by willing. I said, oh, good, great. Now we're on the same pathway. Let's go. And we won the Auckland Championship. <laughs> that's 100% correct. You, no one enjoys losing, right? It's like, it's like kissing no, their... people hate it's losing. Fun. Exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. I, yeah. I just fear. It's, hey, yeah. not only, it's not just um, mathematics, it's English as well. When you've got people like Jack Tame, who really need to go off to uh, learn the English language, if you, when they do, conduct an interview... He, I counted, he says, yeah, 30 times in one short interview. Oh, I can't stand listening to him because of that. I even texted him and say, hey, can you just let the guy speak without interrupting? And if you do want to interrupt, can you use correct English? But well, I never got a reply, of course. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, and you have TV commercials that go next minute and everyone thinks this is really cool. This pigeon English. And it's all rubbish, isn't it? It is, in my opinion. All right, Jack, uh, uh, that'll be enough for this All week, right. and we'll talk again next week. Hey, Cam. Bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Jimmy, good to have you back. Thanks, Cam. Good to be here. What have you got for me this week, mate? So this week, I think we'll have a little chat about education. You've got a couple of kids in, in the school system. I do. Did you see the National Party uh, talking on the weekend uh, about the problem in mathematics? We're just 22% yeah. of the school kids um, in, in Form 2 in the old school or, or Year 8 uh, can't, uh, can do maths. The, you know, 78% can't. Uh, and the numbers get worse if you're uh, in low decile schools or, or uh, a Maori. What are your thoughts on that and what do you think the government is doing about it? Well, to be honest, it's just, it's quite frankly staggering that the, the statistics are so bad. I mean, they've just been in decline for so long. And then finally, the government has talked about changing the way we learn and teach and measuring. And they left a howling about it. But they've had 20 years and it just hasn't worked. We have to change. It's, it's the end of a country if you don't educate your population. You know, and imagine another 30 years. It's, it's just no one in the whole country educated. It'd just be a disaster. So... It's thank goodness they're actually doing something about it. But if the stats I are mean, bad, yeah. they're going to be bad in English, aren't they, as well? Well, the, the, my understanding is it's very bad across the board. It's terrible. Like the open classroom policy has just been a terrible failure. The mixing kids of um, different age groups has just been a just more social, more of a social policy. It's just not education. I mean, when I was at school in the late 80s and 90s, it was quite um New Zealand was quite well placed educationally then and education was really quite black and white, all the same age, the same, you know, quite structured learning. It clearly work. I, I had no idea why they moved away from it. It was just a it's a pattern of the West to go sort of down that woke sort of learning by feeling method. But Do you think it's um uh, but, the problem with the actual system um, meaning the people that are in it as well, because, you know, we tried to bring in charter schools and the teacher unions cut up rough, the Labour Party then abolished them. And they've provided, presided over six years of these year eight students, right? So only the first two years of school that these students who are failing mathematics have been un under any government other than Labour. Uh, don't they hold some responsibility for the failure? And same with the teacher unions. Yeah, I mean, it's just the unions. Why would you not have performance pay? Why do these teachers want to have all this equal pay? I had teachers at high school that horrendous teachers that didn't even they turn up to class and smoke. Like they literally do nothing, and they get the same pay as the te teachers who turn up really well prepared. It's insane. Why wouldn't you want the schools chasing the best teachers? Why do they want everyone to be equal? Why? Because well, they're communists. It's, it's mind blowing. Hmm. Well, that's that's what it ultimately comes back to. That they just want everyone to be equal all the time, but we're just not. 
And so we want to have some competition and we want to have some schools better than others. And we want people to have a culture where they're trying to foster education for their kids. It just, it's mind-blowing, this country. It's absolutely crazy. I just don't think the general public know how bad it is. No, I don't think they do. And, and you know, once you don't have any kids in the system and, and or even grandkids in the system, you kind of stop caring. But um, I think it is, it's critical if you don't uh, educate kids properly, well, it's going to make it very difficult in life for them later. It, it limits their choices. Absolutely. And, and to a, that's to an individual, but to a society, a whole country, you don't educate an entire generation or two. It's horrendous to your country. You know, imagine you've got no educated New Zealanders. You know, it's, you'd either be fully relying on immigration, which would completely change the culture of your country, or head towards a third world situation, which, you know, is, is on the cards. Lindley um, uh, put some numbers on this, said something like 50,000 kids are failing. 50,000. That, that, that's a full Eden Park. <laughs> Terrible, way. Eh? When you say failing, does that mean that they just wouldn't pass the end of year test or is it just they fail completely, like just can't do it at all? Yeah, only 22% of those in year eight can meet the standard. Now, of year eight. I know that we can't talk about failing. I mean, not allowed to use, but in my book, if you're not meeting the standard, you're failing, right? That, that's, that's the real life. That's what happens. Yeah. You can't go through life uh, with only 22% of your workers meeting the standard. You know, imagine if that was, <laughs> imagine if that was actually teachers, right? Only 22% of teachers met the standard for teaching in the class. Right. Well, well I, I did hear something like that, that. The teachers didn't meet the NCAA qualifications for, was it mathematics? They're teaching kids and they can't do it themselves. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, how can you get on if you're as dull as the children that you're supposed to be educating? It's dullards educating dullards. Because dull. they're protected by the, the unions. It's always unions, eh? I don't like to be anti-union because, you know, unions do have their place. There are some unfortunate people in life that need to have someone stick up for them. But but by and large, unions... Cater, 1930s coal miner. Yeah. They, they cater to the lowest common denominator, and in this case, it's a very low denominator. Yeah, I just think that if you want to be a successful teacher in New Zealand, you just, you just can't because you're just going to get measured by the low yardstick of your lazy colleague, and that's just not going to drive ambition, which is just passed on to children. It's, it's just sad. I think Eric Stanford's doing a great job. I've heard her speaking a few times, and she's massively passionate about it. Sounds like she's taken on a lot of problems. Well, she's going like to take it's dire, for her. and that's not going to end well because that's what always happens. Uh, they get the teacher union gets gets stroppy. The national party then gets cowardly, and then nothing much happens. But this has been going on for years. I mean, I can remember when I was in the fifth form, so it's quite some time ago. Uh, my teacher. <laughs> In fifth form maths, was a guy who has had numerous awards in the decades that he was teaching as a maths teacher. He's recognised as a world class maths teacher. And in that year, in fifth form, he would have attended class maybe 10% of the time. And the rest of the time, he sent a prefect along to tell us which chapter of the book we were going to be reading. And, and the quiz at the, at the end of each chapter, and that's what we had to do for homework. And that's what his lessons were like too. So this is a guy who has had decades, 40 years plus, teaching mathematics, and he continued on to teach after I left school, you know, and he's, he's still alive. I looked up his LinkedIn profile the other day, and he's still out there teaching mathematics. And I'm thinking, wow. Jeez, he must be getting on. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's got to be in his 70s now. But but this is a guy who is recognised as one of the best maths teachers. My experience with him as is a teacher... Is that today he's still recognised, or back then? Still. You can look him up. Oh, he's, my God. He's very famous. Competed in the Commonwealth Games. Wow. But but my experience of him was lazy, uh, indolent, Terrible. and appalling, and... As a consequence, I didn't do particularly well at maths because I never had a teacher that educated me or excited me about mathematics. 
that said, I had some fantastic English teachers and history teachers, and unsurprisingly, I scored in the 90% for those subjects because they excited me and taught me to enjoy those topics. Maths, not so much. Yeah, well, look out, because I had, I had terrible English teachers, but good mathematics teachers, so I was the opposite to you. So it really does have an effect on your life, eh? Mm. You know, people say school's nothing, but it does. It really shapes your beliefs, and it's super important, and we just don't have enough priority on it, and a Kiwi culture just doesn't seem to weigh heavy enough on education anymore, whereas it, we were, like, number one in the 1960s or 70s. It's like... Wide. And has become near enough, you know, it's near enough. Oh, that'll do. You know, maths is either right or wrong. There's no middle ground on here. But if they gave it a good go and they showed us they're working, even though they got it wrong, I oh, will give them marks for that. We're now reaping what we've sown. Yeah, but it's right across. It's like even getting rid of winners and losers in school competitions. It's just accepting me uh, currently at all. We've got to get rid of the communists, mate. We need to battle the communists. You know that. <laughs> yeah. This desire to make school equal is insane. Just going to end up with this mediocre country, but at least we'll be equal. Yeah. All right, Jimmy. Yeah. Thanks for coming in to Cam Studies again. We'll talk again next week and try and solve some more problems. We always end up talking about communists, Cam. But thanks, mate. Talk next week. Bye, yeah, mate. See you. Bye. It's always interesting to see what the person on the street thinks, and today was no different. Clearly, the system has failed. My buddies know it, you know it, but it seems the only people who don't know it or don't want to know it are the Labour Party and the teacher unions. Tell us your thoughts on this topic by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. And now it's time for the whale bag. Some general feedback. Ross emails and says, Hi, Cam, what are your thoughts on Liz Gunn's party? Well, the same thoughts I had before the election as I do now. It's a waste of time and a waste of space. Uh, Comment from Facebook, praying the Green Party implodes. They have no value. That's from Charmaine. Now, Dr. Mariwa Glover is the director of the Centre of Research Excellence with over 25 years' experience in tobacco control and over 100 scientific papers. And she joined me last week to discuss her latest research. Uh, Got a very long message here from Nick, who is a foundation member. As I really enjoyed listening to you interview Dr. Mariwa Glover on tobacco. At one stage, she questioned why there was such a hatred of tobacco and nicotine. Have you heard of Dr. Brian Artis? His research on nicotine particularly certainly changed my view on the topic. If I may be so bold as to summarise some of his findings, firstly, he claims nicotine is not addictive. He backs this up. There's a little clip from the 1970s of several CEOs of the large tobacco company swearing under oath before a Senate hearing that it is not addictive. But pyridines, which is one of... at least 499 FDA-approved additives to tobacco products is. He calls nicotine a nutrient. It is also found in cauliflower, eggplants, and nightshades, which are potatoes and tomatoes. Who craves for their next serving of cauliflower? Certainly not my kids. He also cites a study where people with long COVID, read vaccine injury, who hadn't responded to other treatments and had had their symptoms for many months, had been given nicotine patches. They all recovered in a few weeks. Some had initially felt worse, but the symptoms cleared. He claims that the spike protein is actually a snake venom. Also, that the spike protein doesn't bind to the ACE2 receptor, but to the nicotine receptor. And when given nicotine, it flushes out the spike protein. He believes that Big Pharma are hiding the benefits of nicotine as it would severely cut into their profits. So they've had a war on nicotine for many years now. His website is www.thedrardisshow. He makes a dot com. He makes a compelling case. 
I know you are sold on the benefits of nicotine. Would you consider getting him on your show? Keep up the sterling work. Well, that sounds, he sounds very interesting. And yes, I would love to get him on the show. So we'll um, schedule that, Nick, and see how we get on. Anonymous comments says, thanks, Cam, for a brilliant interview with Mari Glover. Mark comments and says, as smoking rates have plummeted, lung cancer rates have continued to rise. Don't assume what you've been told is true. Not much of it is in health. Immunologists have I've spoken with believe vaping is more harmful than smoking. I've had an anaphylactic shock from vaping. It was a badly designed vape, which got too hot. I also had seizures from vaping, being an epileptic. I don't assume vaping is better than smoking. Smoking has never caused me an anaphylactic shock or absence seizures, which were likely due to the metal fumes. It's lobbyists who have made the public believe vaping is healthier than smoking. Anonymous comment says, you say you don't get cancer from nicotine. I agree. What causes the lung cancer? Isn't it the chemicals in commercial cigarettes? Would be great to have an interview about the dangers of vaping. Thank you. Trish writes and says, hi, Cam. Just wanted to say how much I enjoyed and appreciated the interview with Dr. Glover. So many mistruths have been spread about nicotine. I too smoked for years and then decided to quit, which I did straight away. Then my son brought home a vape and I now enjoy the vape some evenings and keep a balance on this. I enjoy it and don't intend to give it up. I believe everybody should have the right to do what they want. I also believe everything in moderation. Of course, not everybody can do that. I understand. Too much of anything is not a good thing, especially people who smoke and end up in hospital and become a liability on the health system. That's not good. Thank you, Cam, for your honesty and sharing your truths. Great show. And some little love hearts there. A uh, comment on Facebook from Matthew before tobacco was bastardized, taken for granted and abused. It was and still is a medicine. Matthew also provided a video uh, which could be interesting. I will see if we can put a link of that onto Mariwa Glover's uh, interview at the bottom of it. Now, Olivia's view. Olivia was back to share her views on global politics. And Peter from Hamilton writes and says, excellent political commentary by Olivia. Uh, w says, Olivia was outstanding, Cam. Words like scalpels to eviscerate the appalling Dems. Love her. And loved Olivia's view. Thanks, Cam. 2016, I did not like Trump as a man, but now as a leader, may he be safe. Now we've got a few comments. Uh, another comment on Robert F. Kennedy Jr., RFK's campaign might be a protracted job application for a cabinet job with Trump. He should get the EPA post. Well, if hopefully you heard uh, my discussion with Marie earlier uh, where we talked about uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s prospects at the coming election. Uh, go and have a listen to that replay and uh, send me some comments. You know how to do it, and we'll read them out. Now, Cam's buddies shared their opinion on the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. And Mark writes, Hi Cam, I totally agree that the opening ceremony of the Olympics did not represent France. What it represented was woke ideology and the disingenuous apology proved it. The Last Supper scene was definitely Da Vinci's Last Supper and not the Bellini one, even though they sort of mixed the two. The big fat whale lady with the false halo was an obvious representation of Jesus Christ and the four groups of three disciples was obvious. Woke ideology denies the Bible, therefore they celebrate everything that is abhorrent to Christians, including lying and cheating, and they proved it by the barefaced lie that they did not intend, intend to offend Christians. Of course, they intended to offend Christians. They would have known that the Last Supper scene was a mockery. Christian bashing is the hallmark of woke ideology. The French failed miserably with their opening ceremony, and my prediction is that this Olympic Games will be the worst ever. And that's the whale bag for this week. That's it for the crunch this week. Wasn't Chris Trotter an absolute delight? His knowledge and history of parties on the left is second to none. If you follow his logic and the history and structure of the Green Party, you can see why they're having 
all sorts of problems. Further, you can see why they aren't getting out of this predicament anytime soon. Alwyn Paul has fantastic insights into education and even better possible solutions. But he's right, we need parents to stand up too, as well as fixing a clearly broken system. But that's why we have these discussions here at The Crunch, to get you the in-depth takes that you need. You can keep up with all my shows, and indeed all of our shows, by using the RCR app. You can even use the app to stream live. So a big thanks for the team that put together the show, make it all work. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving your feedback, enjoying talking to so many people and sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and in this case, education, and everything in between. So a big shout out to all of you. Thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview. And let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Stay tuned for a repeat of Rodney Hyde's Real Talk coming up next, followed by a replay of Truth Speaker with Tobias Tahi. And I'm looking forward to having you join me again next week for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.